Well, happy Friday, everyone. You know what that means, another live lawn care Q&A. My name is Ron Henry, and I am here to help answer your lawn care questions. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome, super happy to have you here. The way this works is really simple. On your screen, you will see a chat box, and in that chat box, you can enter your question, comment, you know, whatever's going on in your mind, and I work through them in the order that they receive them. Now, sometimes I have the answer, sometimes I do not, but Either way, we have an awesome time talking about lawn care and sometimes life. So let's see what we got in the show tonight. Uh, you know, guys, as always, we're coming to you guys live on Instagram, Twitter, fa uh, Facebook, and YouTube, YouTube being our primary platform. And again, feel free to participate in whichever way suits you. For any of you that are that are tuning in on Instagram, you're not gonna be connected to the mainstream. So I'll, I'll be bouncing back and forth between the other platforms in use. So feel free to still be part of it, but it may take me a while to actually get to your question, but I will answer them. Guys, gals, if you're in the Southeast United States, it the time is is near, right? The time to, to, to really kick off the season and get going is, uh, is, is around the corner, right? It's time for pre-emergent. Um, you know, I was looking at average soil temps in my area, in addition to the fact that lawn care services all around here are already out spraying pre-emergent and, you know, doing their thing to try and keep their customers' lawns weed free. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. You guys saw the name of the uh, of the show for tonight. It's really the theme is keeping your lawn weed free in 2024. So we're going to talk about that a bit as far as some strategies like my, the way I like to go about doing it. And uh, just, you know, really looking forward to having a great time hanging out with you guys and talking about lawn care. So, you know, when it comes to pre-emergent, like, and again, for any of you guys that are on here, most people that are watching this, that if you're, if you're on a lawn care live stream on a Friday night, you probably have heard of the term pre-emergent, but in events you haven't, what exactly is it? So pre-emergent is a special type of herbicide that is designed to prevent weeds from germinating or becoming a problem in your lawn in the first place. Hence the name pre-emergent, like prior to the weeds emerging is when you need to apply this. And it does a lot of the heavy lifting. If you ever look at your, in your neighborhood, again, if, if the, some of you guys that are watching the show, it's your first time and you know you see some of your neighbors, like their lawns are covered in weeds and you see other neighbors maybe right next door and there's hardly any weeds in their lawn, more than likely the person that, whose lawn is weed free 
has a program that incorporates pre-emergent, like well-timed pre-emergent applications. So the nice thing about it is that really you only have to do pre-emergent twice a year. So really in the fall is when I like to rec recommend people do it. And then again, now in the springtime or, or just before springtime um, is a great time to apply it. So the question that I get in emails I've been receiving this week is around like, is it too early to apply my pre-emergent? When is the actual best time to, to apply spring pre-emergent? And the most correct or most accurate answer is before the average five day soil temps are in the mid fifties. Cause at 55 degrees or thereabouts, that's when weeds like crabgrass begin to germinate and become the bane of your existence throughout the spring and summer months. So by getting the pre-emergent applied and watered in so it's in the soil profile prior to the average soil temps being in the mid 50s again not when they're in the mid 50s prior to that you're going to do a lot for just keeping weeds um, out of your lawn so you know it's funny i was looking at the, the weather forecast for the southeast united states i'm in northeast georgia so if we look at the weather forecast for gainesville you can see that our lows at night we have one low tomorrow night it's going to be yeah, in the, the high 30s, but you know, we're at 57, 59, uh, 49, 60, 58. So we're getting up there as far as temperatures go, right? But remember, when it comes to timing your pre-emergent application, the soil temperature is really the important thing. And what tends to happen is that the, the soil temp tends to lag a little bit behind what air temperatures are. So if you're someone, there's a couple different tools online that, that you can use for finding out what the average soil temperature is in your area. Syngenta makes a really good one. Uh, it's probably the most popular one. If you just if you Google like average soil temps in my area, it's more than likely gonna load their app. But if you're someone that makes use also of the, the My Soil Test Kits, right? Which is another another great tool that you should be using this year. Um, it's something that they recently added that, that it will tell you based on your zip code that you put in, what the average five day soil temps are in your area. So for me, I like to get my pre-emergent out when soil temps are like in the high 40s trending warmer. So high 40s to low 50s, that's a good time to get your pre-emergent out. So in my area, I can't look at where you guys are, but if I if I show you guys my soil test portal, I don't think I've got that here, and I pull that up, you can see the average five day soil temps in my area are 46 degrees. Can you see that? You make that out? Actually, let me get let me get this uh, get this off the screen, or so you can see that because I'm covering it up. You see there it says in my area it's 46, right? So 46, trending warmer. So that's a great that's a great window as far as a great timing as far as getting my pre-emergent out. And again, a lot of the professional services in this area, in my area anyway, have been spraying pre-emergent for the past three weeks already. So like mid-January, first second week of January, they're out spraying pre-emergent. So if you're in the Southeast United States, so Georgia, certainly Florida, South Carolina. Um, maybe some parts of North Carolina, Mississippi, along, along the Gulf Coast, it's a good thing to consider uh, as far as getting your pre-emergent out. Because when it comes to keeping weeds out of your lawn, you know, a bag of pre-emergent, depending on the size of your lawn, can cost you $40 up to maybe $60, you know, mid-60s, somewhere, somewhere thereabouts. And the, the cost of that is so much less than having to go out and invest in, you know, selective herbicides to try and clean up weeds after the fact. So, that's my whole spiel on pre-emergent. It's really important. It's one of the best things, one of the best decisions you can make towards having a uh, a weed-free lawn. Um, now, as far as options, you can. The you know, next thing you're gonna ask me is like, which pre-emergent should I recommend? Probably the most the most one of the more popular ones um, for springtime is a pre-emergent called Prodiamine. Um, that's what I'm gonna be spraying hopefully this weekend. The plan is to get that out uh, this weekend at some point. Um, so Prodiamine is very popular. There's also another pre-emergent called Dithiopera that's also quite uh, that's quite popular um, for a spring pre-emergent app. Either of those is going to do a great job. You know, as far as coverage, you get you know three to four months depending on weather um, of, of of suppression, which is great because you want it to really work throughout that time period when a lot of the weeds, your your broadleaf weeds like spurge and your grassy weeds like crabgrass, are beginning to germinate, become a problem in your lawn. So uh, so yeah. So again, if you're in the United, if you're in the southeast United States, so you're Georgia, really I'd say you want to get your pre-emergent out before February 15th. Even if you're going to be doing a split app, do your first app before February 15th and then your second one, you know, you can save that towards later like late March, early April time frame, but you want to you want to get on the ball. When it comes to pre-emergent, kind of as the name implies, again, it needs to be in the soil prior to the weeds emerging for best results. A little bit early, a week or two early is better than a week or two late. Because if you apply it after you're already seeing weeds in your lawn, 
I mean, it'll it's gonna help for any new weeds that try and germinate, but really the stuff that's there already, then you gotta start, you gotta resort to, you know, post-emergent herbicides. Celsius, Certainty, if you got cool season grass, some kind of three-way or tenacity or something like that. So it's it's far easier to have to use those sparingly than have to rely on them heavily to keep your lawn weed free in, uh, in 2024. As far as where you can pick some of them up in case you're interested, I'd hopefully I've sold you on the merits of pre-emergent and why it's like one of the best investments you can make assuming you want a weed free lawn, is if you go to the golf course lawn store and you go to shop and weed killer, under there, you'll see a filter. There's tons of different herbicides here, post and pre-emergent, but we're gonna, we're gonna filter by pre-emergent and you got a couple of options. You have Spectacle Flow, which is really one that I prefer to use in the fall. Some people use it in the springtime, but it's really more of a fall pre-emergent in my opinion. And then you've got Prodiamine in a granular format and then Prodiamine in liquid form. So it really depends on which way you like to go. Uh, in the description for each of these, there's videos that show how I like to use them. It's not the only way to do it, but it's, it's how I like to do it. And then um, there's, there's also Dimension or Dithiapir as well. That's currently sold out. We're going to be getting some more in stock here soon. So if you want to go with Dithiapir, you just you know click on that on that um, that link and then sign up to be notified so that when we do get it, you'll be the first to know. So uh, if I can if I can implore you to do anything, if I could ask you to do two things this year, like get a soil test so that you're fertilizing appropriately and put and put out your pre-emergent. Because if not, here's what's going to happen. And I'm going to be like a I'm going to predict the future, right? Now it's really hard to do, but I'm going to predict the future for you guys. For those that don't put out their pre-emergent, come like April, May, a lot of this show is going to be, I've got this weed in my lawn. How do I get rid of it? You know what I mean? So if you don't want to be that person, get your pre-emergent out. All right. So now that we've covered that, I have, I have beat, I have beat the, that, that horse to death. Let's see what questions or comments we have this evening. All right. Start kicking it off. We got uh, Robert Rainey saying, good evening. Good evening, Robert. Hopefully you're doing well. Thanks for taking the time to come hang out in the live stream. If we look over here on the gram, we got Shauna. What's going on, Shauna? Uh, Shauna says, Spectacle did amazing for me. My last app was 12.9. When should I put down Prodiamine? Uh, you, you just heard Shauna, as far as your first pre-emergent app, um, you know, when before, before the average soil temps in your area are in the mid 50s, I believe you're in Texas. So depending on where you are, again, February, February 15th is where is where I'm telling people in my area, my immediate area to get it out before then. You might be able to wait a little bit longer depending on, um, you know, where you are in the country. The thing is you use Spectacle Flow, which is an excellent, as far as, as far as like fall pre-emergence for warm season turf, it's really hard to do better than Spectacle. So you, you did really well with that. I'm not surprised you're not getting a lot of breakthrough with that product. Um, so yeah, good job. You did, you use the good stuff and you're getting um, a great result. So no surprise there, right? All right, next up, we got Mr. Jason Harrison in the house. He says, oh, it's almost Friday night, lemonade season. Yeah, man, I got to switch back to lemonade. I've been on the Arnold Palmer's here recently for a while. So it's time to, time to reintroduce the, uh, the lemonade again. All right, so our first question of the evening comes from Vahid Navi. He says, I have a question about 0025 fertilizer. Can I apply this kind of fertilizer before summer heat, yes or no? Yeah, Vahid, so what you're talking about is a high potassium uh, fertilizer. When you see like a 0025, a lot of times people will use those whenever there is a noticeable potassium deficiency in their soil, which they would know based on their soil test. And some folks also like to uh, go with a higher potassium fertilizer if you have cool season grass leading up to stressful times. So like for a cool season lawn, that would be the summertime. For a warm season lawn, which I don't believe you have, I think you're in Canada, for, for, for a warm season lawn, um, that would be like coming out of dormancy, like early early springtime or in the fall, um, going going into dormancy. But in your case, you know, in the in going into the summer months, you introducing a higher potassium fertilizer is a is a good idea. You don't necessarily have to do a 0025. Um, another option um, that we carry on the golf course lawn store is um, is this. It's a 12024. So it does have some nitrogen in it, but it's a slower release nitrogen. So this is going to release a bit slower. You know, it's not going to push a lot of growth during the summertime if you decide to use this as your uh, summer fertilizer if you have a cool season lawn. But what, to answer your question, the 0025 that you're looking at there will work uh, will work just fine. Uh, no issues with that uh, whatsoever. So good stuff, man. You look at you, you're already thinking way ahead. You're thinking way ahead of the game. You know, I'm, thinking, I'm talking about springtime, trying to get folks to spray pre-emergent. Your, your mind's already in already in the summer, which which is good. I mean, you know, warm season, cool season lawns tend to have a you know tougher time during the summer months, depending on where in the country you are. Um, but uh, but yeah. 
you know, it's good. It's good that you are, you sure you're, you're making progress. You said, happy Friday, Ron. Thank you for the shipment. You're very, very welcome. And then we got Brian Hall in the house saying, hello, Ron, and everyone in the chat. Nice. What's going on, Brian? So guys, one other thing I wanted to talk about as well, so is around like preparing your lawn. And this this is is really optional. It's not something you have to do, but it will. it's something that I like to do. I've done for several years and it's produced a good result for me. So I'll explain the method to my madness. So as you move into the, the period of, of applying pre-emergent, which if you're in the Southeast United States, if you're in Georgia, um, that time is now. Um, so you have a choice. You have a couple of choices. You can just go out there and you can spray your pre-emergent over the existing lawn, which is nothing really wrong with that. That's what a lot of people do and they get a, a decent result with it. Or you can take this as an opportunity to do a bit of cleanup work, right? So if your lawn has gotten pretty thick from just, you know, no mowing over the summer and, and you've got a bit of... Um, a bit of thatch um, there in the lawn. Something that I like to do is a light turf raking. Again, you're not trying to go aggressive with this. You're not really trying to scalp the lawn uh, this time of year. It's really not, you don't necessarily have to do that. But as far as doing like a light, clean, some light cleanup work, um, it's something that that I've done for several years. And it's, and it's again, it's produced a great result for me. So something you can consider. Um, so, so something I'll, I'll show you here is um, what I'm talking about. So I think I've got some video here. So this is the back lawn after turf raking. You can see the stripes are nice and defined because part of what happens with that is it is it combs the grass to grow in a, a specific specific direction. There's another shot um, that was taken. Again, that's that's a that's a re recent picture taken this week. And then finally the material. So if you look at that, there's there was literally no dirt or anything like that. Like the the, the machine was set up to where it wasn't. It wasn't touching the soil or anything like that. I didn't, I didn't get in the dirt at all. Literally, this is like light, really light combing. This is just the light stuff that's just sitting in the lawn. And the nice thing about that, if you think about it, when you're spraying pre-emergent, right, the idea is that it needs to get to the soil to work best. You don't want it really um, being being hung up in the thatch layer. You don't want it on the on the leaf of the grass. You want it in the soil. That's how it, how it works best. So by removing all this garbage, right, which again, you look at the lawn, you don't, you, know, you can tell it's not it's not ripped up. It's not damaged. It's not, you know, it's not, not um, not hating life or anything, by getting all that garbage out, um, it makes it easier um, for the, the the product to get to the soil where it can work best. I got a video, short video that I'll show you guys as well, in case you're interested, you want to see, um, just showing um, how the lawn looks afterwards. This is turf raked in two directions. So this is raked away from the house. And then I'll show you guys here everything that came out of it. It was enough material that it filled up two trash cans and I've still got a big pile there on the on the patio that I will uh, get rid of. And um, so I did it in this direction. And then I did it in this direction. And again, completely optional. Not you don't, you don't strictly have to do this. If you have a machine or you have the tools to, to do it, then by all means. Um, a side benefit is that it, it does make the lawn look quite nice, even though it is dormant. And it does improve um, the effectiveness of your pre-emergent because it doesn't just sit, you know, it, it, it makes it easier for it to get towards the soil where it can uh, where it can do its magic. So just something to consider. You know, some of the some of the other members of the Golf Course Lawn Academy have been doing that as well too. So if you look, I think I got some pictures here. One from Demarculus Thompson. Um, this is him after a very light turf raking on his lawn. And he sent me this picture and it was an interesting one, right? So if you look at this, look here, if you look close, you can make out there's still some green, there's some green within the in the lawn. And the reason why he sent me this picture because he said, you know, a lot of folks this time of year, if you see weeds in your in your lawn, they like to go out and spray like a non-selective herbicide, like like Roundup, like glyphosate, which I I've personally seen it when people have sprayed Roundup on a, air quotes dormant grass, and then when springtime rolls around, you end up with a bunch of dead patches of of lawn. So I it's something that I'm very much against doing. I mean, the only reason to really just to use Roundup on a lawn is that it's it tends to be less expensive than a selective herbicide. But if you, again, he, he sent me this picture saying, hey man, look, you know, had I had weeds in my lawn, I sprayed, you know, Roundup, I, I more than likely would have damaged this part of the lawn. So there's a little bit of green in there. Even though your lawn looks dormant, there might be some areas that are, that are still actively growing that are still green. And staying away from non-selective herbicides like glyphosate are just a good idea. If you, unless you wanna roll the dice of, of having damage in the springtime. So there's something else to consider. Got some other pictures here. This one was from Jason. He sent some of his front lawn um, after turf raking. You can always tell the, the stripe action looks looks real solid. So thanks so much for sending those, uh, Jason. Another shot, and there you go. And he didn't show me a close-up of the bags, but it looks like those bags that are in front of the garage, I imagine, have the debris 
that came out of his lawn. So just something something to consider. That's that's really optional because you do have to have um, a piece of equipment, a specialized piece of equipment to be able to do that. And if you don't have it, then I don't know if some people, they may not want to invest in that, but it, it does, it is, it is helpful. And, it, and another benefit to it is it cuts down on how much work you're going to have to do as far as scalping in scalping time come March, assuming that's something you're going to do on your, your warm season lawn. All right, so we have a super chat, our first super chat of the evening. This one is from Mr. John Williams. Thank you uh, so much, John. Here we go. Super chat. Super he says, Mirimichi green pest control and blue marker dye. Can those be blended together to spray? That stuff is the best. Knocks out bugs with no problem. Yeah, yeah, they can, uh, John. So you can you can add a, um, a marker dye to them. So here's the only thing I would tell you on that is that the... The Miramichi Green Pest Control, which I'll show you guys what John is um, is talking about here, is, uh, where is that? It's under shop, and I think it's under fungicide and insecticide. So this product here is our non-toxic uh, pest control offering from Miramichi Green. Um, you can spray it on patio, outdoor, for pretty much anywhere outside, you know, on plants, um, you know, your patio, patio furniture, all this kind of stuff. It really doesn't leave much of a residue and actually kind of smells nice. So the only thing I would tell you, John, is that if your plan is to only use this product on the, um, on like plants or on the lawn, then sure, I'm mixing a little bit of marker dye in there, not, no big deal. But if your plan is to spray like the patio or furniture or, you know, anything that, you know, your significant other might be upset about if it turns blue, then don't, I would not do that. So that's the only thing I would say. Um, there's no issue with mixing that, but it, um, you just want to be more cognizant of where you spray it because it's going to turn whatever you spray it on blue. You know what I mean? So if, um, again, if all you're dealing with is plants, no big deal. And, uh, you can, you can go forth and, um, and kill bugs with reckless abandon. Right. And you're right. It is a great product. The nice thing about that is that, uh, due to the formulation, it's um like like bugs really can't form a resistance to it. So if it works, you know, works now, it's going to work just as well a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. So it's a great product. And John, for you being the first super chat of the evening, you are our show sponsor. So there you go. Your name in lights for whatever that means to you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, for the support and for the super chat. Now, guys and gals, we got 115 people in here. I know we're only 20 minutes in, but if you guys would not mind helping me out, if you guys wouldn't mind hitting that like button ever so gently, it doesn't cost anything at all. It's a great way to support the channel, support the content, sends great vibes to YouTube, and gets more people to come this way and uh, and hang out with all us lawn care nerds, right? So if you guys would not mind hit that that uh, that like button, it really does mean a lot. We only got like. 40 likes and 100, again, 115 people in here. So we can do better than that. No, we can do better than that. Okay, so moving on, we got Chris Styles in the, in the house. He says, yo, what's up? What's going on, Chris? And then next we have Higgy Pop. Higgy Pop is in the house. He says, hello, Ron. Great day here in the great state of Georgia. I added the great state part, but you, you guys know Georgia is a pretty awesome state. His says, temps are going up. I am dropping my pre-emergent tomorrow. Let's go. I like it. I like it, Higgy Pop. You're, you know, you're ahead of the curve. Really up until mid-February, you got time, but I mean, why not get it done now, right? It's going to be, today's the second, so why not get it done, you know, ahead of the time? You know, a little bit early is better than a bit late when it comes to pre-emergent. So I like it. I like where your mind is. Uh, next up is Alex Toby. He says, Hello, does anyone know how to control blue stem? Ooh, um, I don't know if many, I don't know if there's really any selective herbicides for that. You you might want to, you may have to use glyphosate, Alex. I mean, look into it. Um, I, I believe that um, you might you might be stuck with um, with being really careful and using uh, glyphosate to control that. So I, I, off the top of my head, again, I might be wrong on this, but I don't know of any uh, selective herbicides for blue stem. I can take a quick peek here. I don't, I don't think so though. I think that's one of them that I, um, that I spoke about, um, in one of the blogs, but yeah, just do some, do some research on it. But I, I don't, I don't believe there's not a selective herbicide that I'm aware of, especially that is, uh, labeled for use on residential properties. That's another thing. There, there are some, like, there's some, there's some, uh, herbicides that are designed for use on like pastures, um, that I believe are labeled to control that, but they're they're not labeled for residential use if memory serves me correctly. So just just double check that. Um, 
sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. You may have to look in glyphosate and see the effectiveness of that. But if it is effective against blue stem, you're going to want to be careful. You're not going to want to, you know, you're going to make sure that you use, like use a paintbrush and, or a sponge and like, you know, wipe it on the leaf or um, you want to keep it away from plant life that you do care about. So just something, uh, something to consider there. All right. Uh, we have another super chat. Uh, this one is from, um, from Mr. Archie Amos. What's going on, Archie? Thank you so much for um, all the love and support. I really do appreciate you. Let me get your, uh, your super chat up here. All right. Where are you? You are right there. So you're calling, you're trying to summon the LG, huh? What's going on, Archie? Um, no question, but just a super chat. I appreciate that. So for that, you are now the top donor, making you the show sponsor. So there you go. So your name in lights for whatever that means to you. Thank you for all the love and, uh, and support. All right, back to where we left off. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. All right, uh, next up is Tito Serrano. Tito Serrano, he says, does any company make a hose, and I guess a hose end sprayer, hose end sprayer ready to go for pre-immersion like the ones for weeds? Hmm, I don't, I don't know Tito, but here's the thing, I mean, it's not so much, it's not so much the, the sprayer, like there's plenty of hose end sprayers out there, but the the dilution rate for pre-emergent, like take take like for for, for diamine, um, it's it's very precise. You know, you take like for example for Bermuda grass, the amount of prodiamine um, that you would apply for Bermuda, like the max rate, is like an eighth, like 0 0.80 ounces. Actually, actually it's 0.83, but 0 0.80 ounces uh, over a thousand square feet, and that's the annual limit. So to give you an example. Whenever I'm mixing pre-emergent with my four gallon backpack sprayer, that works out to 3.2 ounces. So it doesn't take very much. Like you take some, a, something like this, a cup like this, let, set down the scale, zero the scale, and it gets up to like right there. So it's not very much of the product that it takes to cover, in my case, 4,000 square feet. So I'm spraying 4,000 square feet at a time. I, I don't know that you would be able to accurately measure or meter that out properly um, with a... Um, with a hose and sprayer that's connected to your house. Like you'll see like the professional services, they have like a big tank mix of prodiamine, but they have the flow rate managed, they have the head that's that's designed for, like in other words, the entire system is designed to spray the product at the, at the appropriate rate. You know, from house to house, there can be differences in spray pressure. And I just don't know that you're, um, that even if someone made one, that you'd be able to accurately apply the product um, using a hose and sprayer, which is why you don't really see um, you don't really see um, see people doing that. You know, they use like a backpack sprayer or a handheld sprayer or something, something where you can you can control uh, the the application rate. So I would encourage you to to not do that if that's what your plan is to you know get invest in a backpack sprayer. Like we carry one on the golf course lawn store, but you can get one from pretty much everywhere. I mean, when it comes to when it comes to sprayers, it really is more the Indian rather than the Arrow. I mean, there are better, there are there are definitely better sprayers out there than others. But if, as long as you have a sprayer and it's calibrated properly and you're using the correct spray tip for the product you're applying, you can get a great result. So the thing I tell you is that if you're going to be spraying pre-emergent, you're going to want to use, actually I took it off the, the sprayer to bring it in to show you guys. You're going to want to be using a spray tip that um, produces a larger droplet size. So one that looks like this. So this is the flood jet spray tip, um, you know, the spray that we carry on the golf course lawn store, it includes this very spray tip. And you can see how wide that notch is. The the, ben the benefit of that is that it produces a larger droplets because the idea behind pre-emergent isn't to get on the, the leaf of the plant, it's to get in the soil for it to work. So you wanna more so, um, if you decide you're gonna go out and get a sprayer from somewhere, make sure that you invest in one of these. I mean, they're like, if you buy one on like Amazon, whenever they're like, six dollars they're not they're not that expensive and it does make a, a difference in um in the results you get when it comes to spraying pre-emergent on your lawn and if you're interested i will put a link to is that the flood, flood jet tip yep i'll put a link here in the chat for you um to the flood jet tip so you can um you can use the right equipment at least the right spray nozzle anyway for applying the product so hope that is helpful uh sir all right, next up we have, I gotta speed up, got a lot of questions tonight. Be here all night. Uh, next up we have a Higgy Pop. He says, friendly reminder, this is a great time to get all your lawn equipment tuned up. Tell me about it. So I am promised that I'll be getting my mower just back tomorrow, I hope. I mean, that's what I've been, I've been told. So they should be back here tomorrow. And it's a great time of year, guys, because you know if you start 
you know, you fast forward two months from now and you say, hmm, I have a lawnmower and I need a lawnmower to cut grass, you know, especially if it's a real mower, like all the shops are gonna be busy and you don't want them to be, you know, so slammed that they're just trying to rush on your piece your piece of equipment. I'm not saying the services would, but one of two things is gonna happen. Either they're gonna, they're gonna work a little bit faster than they normally would, or you're gonna be without your mower for a longer period of time. And right now, having a mower isn't, you know, it's not, it's not that big of a deal right now, but if you are, you know, really trying to step your game up, you want to have your equipment sharp and ready to go once the, once the lawn wakes up and comes out of dormancy. So just something to consider. Great PSA, Higgy Pop. If you have equipment it needs to be taken care of, now is a great time to do it. You know, fresh a fresh oil change, you know, get it sharpened, just have it set up to where you are, you are good to go whenever, um, whenever Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, you know, you guys, I guess you guys with cool season turf, your lawns, I mean, they, they'll begin greening up here even more so soon. Um, just have all your equipment ready so you're nice and sharp and, and can get a great result. Cause it's a big part of it. You know, I always tell folks, you know, you can do all this other stuff. You can, you can soil test, you can fertilize, you can do biosimilants, you can do, you can do all these things. And really the appearance, not necessarily the health of the grass, but the appearance of the turf um, really comes down to mowing. It comes down to having sharp equipment and using it you know, using it regularly. That's that's what's gonna really set your lawn apart, give it that golf course lawn look. Um, and, you know, do you take a lawn that has everything else done right versus, and you're cutting it with like a dull mower to where you're, or a dull blade where you're, where you're tearing up the grass, it's not gonna look good. And you're gonna be more prone to having disease problems in the lawn and all this kind of stuff. So do yourself a favor, you spend money on everything else. You know, you spend money on fertilizer, herbicides, all this other jazz. Spend, you know, the 15, 20 bucks if you got a, you have a rotary mower or the 100, $120 if you have a real mower. Get it sharpened, get it tuned up so you are set to go once the season starts. It's a, it's a good investment. All right, next up we have another super chat. This one is from Mr. Luis Ayabareño. What's going on, Luis? Thank you so much. Super chat. He says, Ron, 12 plus inches of snow finally melted. Good Lord, I can't, I can't imagine what would happen if we got 12, almost over 12 inches of snow in, uh, in Georgia. Be bad. He says, lawn really never fully went dormant. Next two weeks, temps in the 40s, low 50s. Planning an essential G application. Would a liquid spoon feed also be okay or wasteful? Thanks. So I'd say this, uh, Luis, your lawn is, the snow's finally melted. If you are mowing your lawn, I'm probably not doing it now, but let's say over the next couple of weeks, you're gonna start mowing your lawn again, uh, and you wanna go out and do an essential G, yes, that sounds great. If you wanna go out and do a liquid, um, just a liquid app, I, I don't know what I would do granular fertilizer just yet, but if you wanted to do just a liquid spray, so if you're doing the carbon kit, you're talking about a tenth a pound of nitrogen, hardly anything. I wouldn't be opposed to that. Um, but the, the but a good way to judge that is: Are you out doing stuff in the lawn? Are you out mowing the lawn? In which case, yeah, you know, if you want to go out and put, do a, a light a light spoon feed just of the liquid component of it, then I'd say go for it. So it sounds like a good plan to me. Sounds like a great plan. Again, thank you so much for the super chat, sir. I think you are now our show sponsor. Which make, let me get that all. Uh, all squared away. You know, Luis, one day, one day, I promise, I'm going to be able to type your name without having to look so I don't misspell it. I always forget. I should just, as you remember, it's just two R's. Two R's. Roll the R. And there we go. Thank you so much, sir. Your name in lights, for whatever that means to you. And uh, yeah, congrats on, you know, the snow melting away so you can actually see your lawn again. It's good, good times. Good stuff. Okay, uh, moving on, we have, let's see here, nothing on the gram. On the Instagram, you guys are quiet tonight, man. All right, next up we have Colin. Colin's in the house, CPMs is in the house. He says, what's up, Ron? Got my power raking slash dethatching in this week, last weekend, also applied my pre-emergent. Nice, I like it. I like it, ahead of the curve. And again, if you decide to do that, if you decide the turf rate, you don't need to go aggressive with it. You don't need, don't, do not like the, if the tines are anywhere near touching the soil, you're doing it wrong. Like it needs to be, like you need to raise it up to where you're just literally just lifting and just getting any loose debris out of the lawn. That's all it is. Like if you look at this picture here, which one is it? I think it's the third one. This one here, like if you could run your hands through that, it's all light fluffy stuff. There's not any, there's not a single root in there. It's all just a light, you know, garbage that just accumulates on the lawn um, over the over the late fall and winter months. So I just like to get that out before I put my pre-emergent down. So nice job, Colin. Uh, good job getting your pre-emergent done. You're ahead of me, which is which is great. And uh, next up, we have um, Jason Harrison says, uh, Anderson's is working on one. Cool, yeah. Well, if anyone's gonna pull it off, Anderson's will, right? I mean, I I'm sure they'll have, 
I wonder what it's going to do. I wonder if they're going to have like a pressure regulator on it or something. So I guess, to, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Interesting to see how that works. I guess like you need to have some kind of a pressure regulator to make sure that like the flow rate is what what they expect it to be. So you can stuff out at the right rate. So hmm. stay tuned. Keep us posted, Tito or Jason, as far as how that works out. All right, next up is Jared George. Uh, Jared George. He says... Um, what's up, Ron? Thank you for posting the updated schedule. Question, on your first insecticide application, are you basing that off of temperatures? What should I look for to know when it's time? Yeah, I base it more so around the, the life cycle of, of grubs, Jared. So um, I liked, I've done my insecticide apps in um, in, a, in the April timeframe. So I'll do a Celeprin then. And then if you're gonna do another app, you could do one in the late summer. So July, August timeframe. So getting it, getting it down um, in April is a good time to, to help to, to interrupt that. In, to, it's the ideal time within their cycle to prevent grubs from being a problem in your lawn as the, the season progresses. So late March, early April is when I, I tend to do it. It's not, it's not really based on, uh, on temperature. Um, and if you're interested, there is a new blog post that we put out. We have a couple of blog posts on this topic, but there's one that was recently done here on grub control. So if you're interested on, on grub control, why they stink, how to get rid of them, when to, when to apply them, types of grubs, the kind of damage they can cause, um, all this kind of stuff. There's a relatively new article that was written this month on that. And I will, um, I'll send that to you here in the chat. So you will you'll be all squared away. This is one of several articles on the on the store, but this is one that um, we just refreshed for 2024. So there you go, Jared, um, and hope that helps. And, and, the, and the insecticide that I use is a Celeprin. So I'll show you that really quick here. We got a couple of different options. If you go to the, to the golf course lawn store and you go to shop and fungicide insecticide. So there's two, there's two insecticides that we carry. Um, one is granular, um, one is granular and the other is available as a granular and liquid. So you have Caravan G, which is a combination fungicide insecticide. Uh, that one, um, if you're going to apply that, although I'm a fan of getting insecticide out in April, you really could wait till May because, you know, for a preventative fungicide app, May is a better month to do that. April is a little bit early unless you've got like a history of disease in your lawn that time of year. So Caravan G is one option. The better option, in my opinion, is to go with a Celeprin. A Celeprin is a the the active ingredient in a Celeprin is a um, is called Chlorantranopril, um, and it is um, it's it's kills more stuff or controls more insects than what's in Caravan, um, and it's also better for the environment. So as far as not harming pollinators or earthworms like invertebrates, um, a celeprin is a superior product. So what I do for my fungicide and insecticide applications, instead of doing an, an all-in-one product like Caravan, which again can work, um, and it is a little bit less expensive, is I will do a celeprin for my insecticide and I will do pillar SC or headway for my fungicide. So I decouple them. I do, you know, fungicide app when it's when it's ideal time and do the insecticide app when it's the ideal time. And I, I like the results that I get with that. And a celeprin is available in a um, in granular or liquid. Just really depends on which which you prefer, whichever your your preference is. They both they both work well, both work equally well. Um, I primarily use the liquid because it's just it's just easier for me. If, if I want to spray anything else along with it, um, you know, I can just I can throw this in the tank along with whatever else I am putting down. So Hope that helps, sir. Great question. Need anything else? Definitely let me know. Um, next up, we have a comment from another super chat from Fernando. I think Fernando's out of Florida. He was dealing with some disease problems in his lawn. Super chat. For he says, hey, Ron, Pillar SC is working great. I can see the green coming up. Thank you again. Yeah, that's the thing, um, Fernando. And, you know, he and I were talking about this. We're going back and forth. Like what if, when you have a disease problem in your lawn, when you apply fungicide, it's not like it reverses the damage. It prevents it from getting worse, which is, you know, it arrests the spread of the disease, which then over time is going to allow the, the lawn to heal, is going to allow like new growth. And, and that's what it sounds like Fernando is seeing. So awesome, sir. Glad to hear that you're getting a good result with the product. I really like it. I really do like Pillar. And the nice thing about it is if you look, you compare like, um, for example, let me show you here. If you, if you compare like Headway and you look at the label for it, it'll have, there's like a slew of different rates you would use depending on the disease you're trying to control. Whereas with Pillar SC, there's really just one rate. It's one ounce per thousand square feet. So it doesn't matter if you're using it as a, as, um, as a preventative or, um, or to control an active problem, it's the same rate. One ounce per thousand square feet is what you would apply Pillar at. So I'm glad that you're getting a great result, uh, Fernando. I appreciate the super chat. Thank you for all the love and support and keep me posted on how 
the lawn uh, continues to develop, how it can how it bounces back from that um, from that problem. All right, good stuff. Uh, next up, we have. Um, did I miss? I'd miss Brian. Brian said, "Oh well, oh well, oh well." After another a disappointing loss from the Lions last Sunday, the weather is getting much better here in Michigan. Still waiting for spring twenty twenty four. Uh, yeah, man, here's the thing, man. The Lions went pretty far. I would have loved to see them in the Super Bowl, but whatever. Now we got, you know, we got the 49ers and Taylor Swift. I mean, um, the uh, the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. So, you know, we'll just, we'll have to just make do, right? I think that was a matchup a couple years back, wasn't it? So maybe the Niners will do it this time. Although, I don't know. Mahomes is pretty good. I mean, the Chiefs were not playing great towards the end of the season. And then, you know, when it, when they have to win, they win. So that's all that really counts. You can, so uh, we'll we'll see. Should be a great game. All right, next up is uh, CPIMS. He says, got it done uh, in good timing because SoCal is getting a lot of rain coming up. Nice. Very, very, very cool. I like it. Uh, Tito says, hit the like button. It's free. Yes, please do, guys. If you have not hit the like button, we got, again, 120 people here in the live stream, only 82 likes. What's up with that? Surely we can do better. That means that some of you guys in here watching this right now, you're saying it's just too much work. Me moving my trackpad or moving my mouse over to hit the like button or dislike button is just too much work. I just can't do it. I just, it's just, it's too much. I'll, I'll sprain a finger doing that. That's what you're telling me, which is, you know, kind of hurtful. It's kind of hurtful. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, Papa Mo's Lowe's. He says, Happy Friday, Ron. Excited to be throwing down some pre emergent tomorrow before Sunday's rain. Yep. You can't beat uh, free, free rainfall, free watering it in. That's an important part of pre emergent. You really want to water it in after application for it to begin working. And Steven's up next. He says, so far we haven't gotten rain like I thought. Uh, a slight mist drizzle for a couple hours, hoping that's enough to water in my granular prodiamine. Uh, you know, you really want a quarter of an inch or so um, or better, uh, Steven. So if you didn't get that and this go around, you will you might get it, you know, a couple of days from now. So, you know, I, I really wouldn't sweat it. You, you got it applied. Um, if you can't run irrigation, eventually it's going to rain and get watered in. I get another reason if you're using granular to... Um, to get it to get it out a bit early. On the topic of granular pre-emergent, you guys may have noticed we've been sold out of granular pre-emergent for a while. Not anymore. It's now back in stock on the store. So uh, manufacturers were changed. It took a while to get that all set up. But again, if you go to shop and the weed killer and then sort by pre-emergent, you'll see a new option for granular prodiamine available in 45 pound bags and 18 pound bags. So there you go. Um, in case you need pre-emergent and you prefer granular over liquid, then you've got uh, you've got an option right there. All right, so next up we have Polywog24. Polywog24, he says, Hey Ron, if if I want to overseed my current Bermuda lawn in April, would you skip applying pre-emergent? I applied prodiamine at half rate in October. I live in Central Texas for reference. Thank you. Yeah, so a couple of things there, Paul. Um, to answer your question, yes, I would. But then again, I also would not recommend that you overseed your Bermuda because most people, like 90% of people that are trying to do that are doing it for the wrong reasons. So if you have like a part of your lawn that is struggling or it's thin or, you know, there's, some, there's something where the Bermuda is not growing well, really overseeding isn't the, isn't the way to do that. It's not strictly, it's not necessary for uh, for a warm season grass, especially like Bermuda. Like Bermuda, once it gets heat, um, heat and and um, sunlight and you know the days are longer it takes off and spreads like wildfire so I would discourage you from doing that I mean again to answer your question if you're trying to if you're going to be overseeding your lawn the next three or four months you would not apply pre-emergent but with Bermuda um, you know if it's not doing well if you have an area that's that's bare there's really only a couple of reasons that that would happen I mean if you in the most the most common culprit is lack of sunlight so if you have an area that of your your lawn or your is shaded, like maybe with the way the sun passes over your house, or there's a tree or something else that's there by there where it just doesn't get a lot of shade, that is going to hurt um, how well the Bermuda grows. You know what I mean? And see, and even if you did go put down grass seed, it's not going to change that. So say you go out and you apply Bermuda grass seed. Um, two things: one, you're going to be introducing a different cultivar, and while um, like I've done this in the past, so this is why I'm telling you this. So while Tiffway 419 and Arden 15, which you can no longer get, so don't even bother looking for it, do blend well together. They look nice together. Like most Bermuda cultivars, do not. And even if you could, let's just say, let's say I, you know, I could Thanos snap, and you could go out and you could. You could get a cultivar that would match your existing grass perfectly. Whatever the conditions are that are causing your existing 
Bermuda to not do well are the same conditions that are going to cause the grassy that you put in to not do well. You know what I mean? So I would solve for that. You know, if you um, you do a soil test to make sure that your nutrients are where they need to be, make sure there's enough sunlight um, so you're not having a shade problem. If you do those things, Bermuda is really not difficult to grow. I mean, it, believe it or not, you know, in some parts of the country, I don't understand it. Some parts of the country, they consider Bermuda a weed. I, again, pains me when I hear people say that. But it's, it's really not hard to grow Bermuda grass, assuming you have those conditions. And the most important of them is, is sunlight. You know, it's got to, you can't have shade. Even a, a small amount of shade um, is, is enough to materially affect how much Bermuda thickens up. So you didn't ask that question, but I figured I would answer it anyway and just tell you, hey, I would really discourage you from, um, from going the route of trying to put down grass seed to solve a problem in Bermuda. And now it closes the lawn, you got a fescue lawn, you know, ryegrass lawn. By all means, go for it. Sure, that's how that's how they that's how they tend to help get those lawns to thicken up. But Bermuda, you really don't have to do that. So, um, so I would again, I would suggest to you that you look into what's causing it, like the conditions. Um, so, what what could cause? We'll recap really quick. So, a nutrient deficiency, some kind of a nutrient problem, um, lack of sunlight. That's the big one. And again, it doesn't take a lot. Like literally, if you have some shrubs that are nearby, like that will materially affect how well the Bermuda within two to three feet of a shrub are growing. And then the other thing you could look into if there's some kind of debris under the lawn. So say you have like a piece of plywood or rocks or stones or something something that is near the surface, like that will also help, will prevent Bermuda from um, from growing and thickening up really well. So I would investigate that. I would I would play be detective, play detective, try and figure out why it, in your particular area, in your lawn, that particular spot, it's not doing well and solve that. And then, you know, then you'll, one, you'll save money and you'll be solving the problem in a way that, ultimately you're gonna be happier with in the uh, in the end. So hope that helps, sir, great question. And uh, if you need anything else, let me know. And again, you with you being in um, in Central Texas, I mean, I don't know, you guys are gonna, you guys are probably not, probably a little bit cooler than we are here in Georgia, um, but you know, I Bermuda's not gonna really start taking off until like March, April timeframe, depending on weather. So just by then, start gauging it and seeing how it's coming in. But in the meantime now, start looking and saying, oh wow, there's a shade, there's a lot of shade here. Or just during the growing season, the sun passes this way over the house. If that's the case, so that's a good point. And let's say it's it's literally is where your house is and the way that the house sits on your property, you're not gonna move your house, right? Um, so your options then are, one, live with it and just realize that that part is just always going to be a little bit thin compared to the others. Or you could like make it that area where the grass isn't growing into a mulch bed or some kind of a decorative element in your on your lawn or your property. Uh, but um, but grass seed is not really going to be the way to, to, to fix it because Bermuda, again, is not difficult to grow. If the conditions are even somewhat right, it takes off and it's, you know, it spreads like wildfire. So hope that helps, sir. Uh, next up, we have Jared George. He says, Ron, the weeds that are currently in my dormant lawn, is there any reason to kill them off before I apply pre-emergent or can I wait until the growing season? Benefit of, for killing now in cold temps. It just depends on how much they bug you. So what, what you tend to find, Jared, is that weeds that grow aggressively this time of year when temperatures are cooler do not do well whenever it gets hotter. So if it's really irritating you, you can use a selective herbicide to knock out the weeds that are in your lawn now. And um, yeah, you can absolutely do that. Is it, if, you're, if your question is, is it strictly necessary to eliminate weeds prior to applying pre-emergent? The answer is no. Um, if you want your lawn to be weed-free, then yes, get, you, know, you can get rid of the existing weeds and then apply pre-emergent and that's gonna make a big impact on preventing new weeds from coming into your lawn. But the existing ones, you either can do nothing, like just wait, give it time and they'll die off when it gets hot or you can use a post-emergent herbicide that's labeled to control them to get rid of them. So you can do that now if you want to. Really depends on you. Depends on how much, how much does it bother you? When you walk out in your lawn and you see, you see green where there should only be brown, like does that keep you up at night? Does it make you, does it make you question like where did you miss the mark and why do you have weeds in your lawn? And it, is it, if, it's, if it's hurting your ego, then I think you should get out there with some, some post-emergent and knock it back, Jared. But if it doesn't really bother you that much, then I would just let it go. Just wait till, wait till springtime. All right, so next up we have Peter uh, Yautzi. Peter Yautzi. He says, hey, Ron, can I scout my newish saw that was installed in July last year? What kind of sod is it? If, it, if it's like Bermuda, uh, sure, you, you, you can. If it's Zoysia, again, yeah, you can. Um, what I would tell you this, Peter, is don't go too aggressive. Like there are some, there are many people, whenever they go and they scout their lawn, you see they'll, they'll take the mower right down to the dirt 
And I, I personally don't really think that's necessary um, for a couple of reasons. One, you're putting a lot of wear and tear on your equipment. Um, and really the idea behind scalping, right, is to is to clean out all that, clean out the, the, the thatch and the debris that's built up over, over the fall and winter months, um, allow heat and sunlight to, to, to get to the soil. And, and really what you're, what you're buying yourself is a fresh start to the season and a green up that's gonna be two to three weeks ahead of people that don't do that. So you didn't say what kind of sod you have. Um, I'm assuming if it's Bermuda, the answer is yes, I would not go too aggressive. So the better question is this, right? You're probably asking me, well, how low should I go? Let's say you're real mowing and I am. You, your, your goal is to maintain the lawn at say three quarters of an inch. If you go say a quarter of an inch beneath that, so say you're gonna maintain it three quarters of an inch, if you scalp the lawn or cut it at like half an inch, that's really all you need. You know, you don't need to get down into the dirt. You don't need to go too too aggressive. It's less work for you. It's not as hard on your equipment and you're still gonna get the result that you're after. So that is what I would um, what I would tell you. you. Again, you didn't tell me what kind of grass you have and that's that's an important part of it. Um, but I'd say just don't don't go too aggressive don't get down into the dirt. And um, can you? Uh, yes, you can. Um, there's and like I said, my my what I like to tell people is um, a quarter of an inch beneath where you intend to maintain the lawn is a good is a good place to go. It's a good balance between work and getting the result that you're after. All right, all right. Stan G's up next. He says, "Good evening, Ron, and live stream lawn care crew. Uh, crew, what's going on, Stan? Appreciate all the love and support, uh, sir." Um, da, 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 da. And we got um, Jacob Arecibo chiming in from Instagram. He says, I just bought the 444, the 444 organic fertilizer, and it got delivered today. Nice. I like it. When should I put it down? Zip code 75. Okay, I know seven. I believe seven is in Texas. Um, St. Augustine. I don't know where exactly that is. Um, uh, um, Jacob, I believe seven is in Texas because I have a family that lives in like, um, you know, in the Houston area and all their area codes start with that. At any rate, um, if you're out there mowing the, the St. Augustine, say it's not dormant anymore, which I kind of doubt this time of year, it's probably not, it's probably not fully out of dormancy yet. Once you're out there starting to mow it and it's beginning to wake up, then you said Dallas. Okay. Then you can feel free to put down the, um, that, that triple four organic. So if I were telling you, uh, March time frame is when I would look to do that. You know what I mean? Like the first, like earlier in March is when you could, you could look to do that, assuming that the weather cooperates. If we don't get a kind of any kind of crazy cold snap, uh, look to uh, to put that out in uh, in March. And the nice thing about that product that you got is that it's both a biostimulant and a fertilizer, so it's a it's a great option for someone that wants to take a more organic approach to lawn care and as a as a way to start the season. So cool stuff, man. Hope that helps. All right, uh, K is up next. K, what is up next? He says, I have poa popping through already. Oh, the dreaded poa annual. Do I treat the POA or put down pre-emergent and treat the POA later? It depends on what kind of grass you have. So if you have cool season turf, like ryegrass, Kentucky bluegrass, fescue, there's not a whole lot you can do about um, POA annual. There's not a lot of great selective options for getting rid of it. If you have Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, and you want to get rid of POA annua, um, you can control it using a, a post-emergent herbicide like Certainty. Like this stuff is awesome, 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 awesome against POA annua, um, but it's only for warm season turf. So again, you got to have Bermuda grass, Zoysia grass, St. Augustine grass, um, centipede, you know, a warm season grass type to be able to use this. The label will tell you what it's, what it's labeled for use on. And you're going to want to use it along with surfactant. Um, if you want any pre-emergence that you apply now, this time of year, K, is really more for weeds that are going to be a problem in the spring and summer months. So like your your crabgrass, your spurge, um, like th those types of weeds are what you're looking to prevent with your pre-emergent now. Applying pre-emergent now isn't going to really do a whole lot against Poa annua because the stuff that you're seeing now started germinating months ago. So if you want to get rid of it, you absolutely can do that. Um, certainty is what I would recommend, assuming you have a warm season lawn. Some people will also wait for it to die out, but that can take, you know, it's really, really going to be, depending on where you're in the country, May, Mayish time frame, And it looks, and POA does look pretty ugly, especially when it starts throwing off seed heads. So um, if you want to get rid of it, go with certainty uh, again. But it's, the important point is it's for warm season turf only. Do not spray this if you have a cool season lawn, unless you're fine with damaging the area that you that you spray it. You know what I mean? It's designed for warm season turf, warm season turf only. Where you can find that is if you go to the golf course lawn store, you go to shop and then weed killer. 
you will see it on the top shelf because that's how much we like certainty. That's how awesome certainty is. It's right here on the top shelf. You are going to want you want to get this, and you're also going to want to get surfactant. So surfactant and certainty are what you're going to want to use to um, to knock out Poanua. As far as the rate, um, so when it comes to controlling Poa, you need to use like the label will tell you this. But the uh, the rate you need to go on the higher end of the application rate. So there's a video in the description for certainty, um, but that video was filmed in the summertime when the goal was to control sedges, right? So poa because certainty is designed for controlling sedges and poa and poanua. Um, so the rates that you see in that video are too low to get good control against poa. You're gonna want to go with a rate of like um, 1.25 ounces per acre up to two ounces per acre. What that equates to is if you have a measuring spoon, which Certainty comes with, let me move this out of the way, um, you got two ends. You got, if this will focus, you got a big end and you got a small end. You're gonna wanna go with one of the big scoops and then one or two of the small scoops per thousand square feet, and that's gonna get you good control for uh, for Poanu. And again, be sure to use surfactant with it for, for best results. And I'll send you a link here where you can pick those up, K. Okay. And again, hopefully that is, um, Hopefully that is helpful. Hopefully that is helpful. Um, let's see, certainty, uh, herbicide, and other stuff. If I could only type. There we go. So that's where, that's where you can find it. But again, I'm assuming that you have warm season turf. And then pre-emergent, again, you're as I said earlier in the show, you're going to want to decide, you want to apply your pre-emergent prior to the average five-day soil temps being in the mid-50s. So if you're in the Southeast United States, again, if you're in Georgia, you can be doing it now. Like now between um, now and middle of February is 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 the ideal time to get your, your initial pre-emergent app out, assuming you're doing multiple apps. All right, so we have a super chat. Another one, this was from Mr. Lance F. Thank you so much, Lance. Super chat. Proceed. He says, Ron, can you please explain the differences between 1608 and the 12024? Looking at for the differences in the speed of release between the two products, is there really a big difference between the both other than the NPK? It's a good question, Lance. So thank you for the super chat. So let's dig into it. So if you go over to shop and lawn fertilizer, what you're referring to are these two products. You're talking about Humic Max, which is a 1608, and the Stress 12024, which is a, again, it's a higher, higher potassium fertilizer. Um, the amount of quick release nitrogen in, or sorry, let's do it this way. The amount of slow release nitrogen in Humic Max is about 35%, meaning that it's the, the majority of it, 65%, is going to release a bit faster, which is why it's it's an ideal product for spoon feeding when you're fertilizing your lawn, you know, once per month. The amount of slow release in the Stress 12 24, if memory serves me, is closer to between 65 and 70%. So it's almost like flipped. It's almost like the opposite, right? So you have 30, 35% quick release, and the majority of the, the nitrogen in this is a slower release, which is nice because it's a great option for waking up the lawn at the beginning of the season. And also, if you have a cool season lawn, then um, in the summertime, the Stress 12 24 is a great option because you're not going to push a bunch of growth. Um, and you also have that potassium to help the, the plant weather uh, stressful conditions. In addition to that, Humic Max, as the name kind of implies, Humic Max, contains almost 9%, 8.9% humic acid, which is a biostimulant that helps with nutrient availability. Um, the Stress 12 24 has 1% humic acid, but it also contains um, some sea kelp. So it's they're different blends. Like Humic Max is strictly, it's nitrogen, potassium, um, and um, humic acid. That's, those are the three major components of Humic Max. Whereas the Trust Soul 024 is nitrogen, potassium. Um, it does have some humic acid in it. It has some kelp in it. And it all, there's also micronutrient in this product as well. There's a bit of iron, manganese, I think zinc. Actually, you know what? Let me show. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Why don't I just look at the analysis? We've got it right here. Okay, cool. So you got some iron, 1.6% iron, some manganese, and some magnesium. Whereas these are not present in Humic Max. So you see what I mean? So they're they they and they may look similar, but they're they're actually pretty different products. Um, again, this is what I would use um, to to wait to start the season for a warm season lawn, um, and I would use this during the summertime for a cool season lawn. So and Humic Max 
is what um, I I use literally from like April April onward, right? When I'm doing spoon feeding, like it's uh, Humic Max is the the product that I'm that I'm using. So hope that helps, sir. Hope that helps explain the differences between the two. Um, and um, and the difference you didn't ask about this, but the complete fourteen seven fourteen uh, contains phosphorus, and it's between Humic Max and the Stressol Zero Twenty Four as far as the amount of uh, slow release nitrogen in it. It's not as much as in the Stress. Um, but it's um, it's but it's not as little as what's in Humic Max. So it's kind of in between between those two. So say you had a soil that is deficient, is phosphorus deficient. So you needed to add phosphorus to the soil. You would substitute Humic Max for the complete fourteen seven fourteen in your spoon feeding program. Does that make sense? So hopefully that helps. That helps clear things up as far as like how they all fit, what they all do, and the, the why the why the different formulations. And, um, and yeah, and there is, there is a pretty big difference between them. So hope that helps. Hope that gets you all squared away, Lance. If you have anything else, don't hesitate to let me know. Now the fun part, where did I leave off, right? Because it always resets every time I go and find someone else. Let's see here. Oh, Archie Amos. He says, evening, young man. Uh, looking forward to a great evening of lawn talk. I'll do my best. I'll do my best, Archie. And then next up, we have Jared George. He says, I actually used the Greencast apps as Agentis tool, yep, to look at my historical records, and it's going to be mid-March for me. Cool. Yeah, so you're further north. It's gonna, it's cool. That's uh, That will work. Uh, next up, we have, but again, Jared, not when soil temps are 50, or in the mid-50s, like before. So whenever your soil temps are like, the average five-day is, say, 50, like 49 to 52 degrees. That's a great time to get it out. You want You want to be like, you don't really gain a whole lot by waiting until it's right at 55 degrees. It's, if anything, a bit early is better than late. So just keep that in mind. You know, you, you want to be a week or two early is not going to hurt you. Not going to hurt you at all. Uh, Craig Jones is up next. He says, hello, everyone. Just finished uh, spraying my pre-immersion, getting prepared. Nice. I like it, Craig. Good job. Andrew Phillips he says, happy Friday, Ron and others from the great state of Texas. I added that part on. He says, looking forward to turf and pre-immersion. Well, those times will be here soon. They're not too far away. Not too far away. And then next up, we got Fescue Me. He says, I was a week late with pre-emergent last year. I paid the price. Yeah, man. So it, it just, it's in the name. Like once, if you, by the time you see the weeds like growing in your lawn, I'm not saying that you, there's no benefit to doing it because it's going to prevent like more growth going forward, but you're really not getting a, the the big benefit like you're not you're, the big thing is you want pre-emergent to do the heavy lifting like you you will still get some breakthrough here and there but that really should be the exception rather than the rule and the the, the thing to get that's the most important to getting the most out of it is the timing of application there's plenty of tools for doing that again Sagenta's got a great app for doing that if you're on if you have the MySoil test kit they also have great data that you can use as well to know what the five day is in your area and again a bit early is better than a bit late when it comes to um, to pre-emergent. All right, uh, let's see. Um, okay, Lawn Guy says, love talking about lawn care and grass, but how can there be anything alive to take care of right now? People take a break and enjoy the winter. Um, yeah, over here on IG. I see you, okay, Lawn Guy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess with you in Oklahoma, I could see that, but you know, here, you know, we're a little bit further south than you. And again, there is, pre-emergent is something that we can and really, should be doing this time of year. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends on where you are in the country. I get it. If you're in Oklahoma, you likely have a bit more time to relax and do a whole, do nothing. If you're in Northeast Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, South Carolina, there is there are things to do. There are things to do that will set you up for domination for, uh, for this year. All right, uh, let's see. Robert Rainey says, um, I am holding off on pre-emergent until I spray out the ryegrass. It will kill off anything that has germinated at that point in time. Gotcha. That's cool. That's another pro That's another um, strategy, Robert. And I guess when are you spraying out the ryegrass? You didn't say, but I guess what, March? March time frame? Is this when you're going to go do it? Two Trilla is up next. He says, happy Friday, Ron and Strap Action Gang. What's going on, Two Trilla? And then next we have Phyllis. Phyllis, great. You're back, man. Glad to see you're doing well. I know you were a, a you're a regular on the live stream last year, and now that we're getting close to having to do a lot of stuff in the lawn, I see you have reemerged. She says, "Hi, Ron and fellow lawn connoisseurs, not enthusiasts, but connoisseurs." She says, "Thumbs up, everyone. Soil test done. Pre-emergent down. Now waiting for a free lawn watering. We'll be getting rain in San Antonio tonight and tomorrow. Nice. Like, you know, this is, my work here is done. I, don't, I can't teach you anything anymore, Phyllis. You got it. You, you know, you're good to go. You got your soil test. You're doing your pre-emergent." You know, you're going to be holding a clinic on your street here soon. Good times. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Andrew Phillips says, he says, we're, uh, that's, a, that's a sidebar. I don't need to do that one. And then next up is um, Brian Hall. He says, hey, Ron, as you know, I live in Michigan. Just curious, when should I send out the soil test for the upcoming spring season? You can do it. You could do it in this sometime this month, um, Brian. Um, you know, February is a great time if you're trying to get data for, um, you know, to, to drive your fertilizer apps for, for this growing season. You know, get it done sometime in February. I mean, you're in Michigan, so maybe late February you could even do. Uh, but just factor that for the time you send your soil test um, the sample in, it's going to be about a week before you get your results back. And then based on what you see in that, you can then order you know, your supplies, whatever you need to be able to cover you for that season. So as long as you leave enough time for that, you know, like a week for the results to come back and then figure another, you know, four or five days for you to get or order and get whatever you need based on the soil test results, you're good. Uh, you're good to go. The soil is not really going to change, you know, too much um, between like now and, and March's time frame. So whenever, whenever you decide you want to go for it, you, uh, you can. All right, uh, Falcon Powell says, unfortunately, my soil temp is still 32 degrees. Can't wait till summer. Yes, yeah, so you, you got a bit of waiting still to do, Falcon Pilot. Next up is Archie Amos. He says, how many times consecutively can you use the same pre-emergent before the lawn no longer responds? It's a great question, Archie. So, prodiamine gets sprayed a lot. And I, you would have thought that by now that, you know, lawns would be getting, would be forming resistance to it. And I just, I just haven't seen that. Like, in my area, prodiamine is, is, the vintage that gets sprayed pretty much every spring. And I've, I've been living here nine-ish years, nine, eight, nine years. Um, so every spring they're spraying prodiamine and the lawns that get sprayed with that pre-emergent do just fine. Like you don't you don't have a bunch of weeds, a lot of breakthrough. Um, what I would say is I would use something different in the fall. So prodiamine in the spring is okay. I would use a different pre-emergent in the fall, mainly because I just don't think that prodiamine is the best option for as a fall pre-emergent. Like if you got warm season grass, you really, really, I mean, it's, it's more expensive, but man, it's expensive because it's it's good. It's, 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 it's worth it. Like if you are in and have warm season turf, you really want to be using this stuff. Spectacle flow is what you want to go with as your fall pre-emergent. I mean, does a great job controlling POA and really you can apply this and then you're going to be good until your spring pre-emergence. So just, you know, you can rotate back and forth. You could do, if you wanted to, you could do prodiamine in the spring one year and then dithiopyr in the spring another year. But I would really stick with spectacle in the fall. I've tested other, like several combinations. I've done just straight prodiamine. I've done dithiopyr in the fall. I've done um, prodiamine and um, princep and imaziquin in the fall, which works pretty good. It gets kind of close to this, but doesn't last as long. And by far, by far, the best option is this for a fall pre-emergent. So what I'd say is really you're only going to be using it once per year, springtime, and you're going to be using Spectacle in the fall, and that you really shouldn't have an issue with a resistance if you go that route. I have not heard of, of people getting um, having resistance issues. I mean, there might be, but I've not come across, not I've not personally experienced that, um, and I've not heard, and no one's written to me and said, hey, this is what's going on with my lawn. Is it, you know, you think I'm having a, a, a problem where prodiamine isn't as effective anymore? It could happen. It could happen, but um, but yeah, I have not seen that as yet. All right, um, okay, Long Guy says, do you go to the Masters? I've been, how many times have I been? I've, I've been once. I've been to the Masters once, and it was during the, um, it was during a practice, a practice round, and it was incredible. Like, I mean, like, if you, if you love turf grass, even if you don't, even if you don't like golf, right? You don't say you don't like golf, and I completely get it. It's worth, it's worth paying pilgrimage to Augusta Nationals, because, you could, like, what you see on TV, as incredible as it looks on TV, it, like, seeing it in person doesn't do it justice. It just doesn't. Like, you, like in areas where you don't even really need to care about the grass, they care about the grass. Like, I mean, it's just a, it's just a different level of, um, of commitment. Commitment to just growing a really good stand of turf grass. I mean, it's, it's, it's like nothing else I've ever seen. I mean, there's no, I've seen a lot of, I've been a lot of golf courses. Um, I've seen a lot of great lawns. I have I have yet to see anything that that approaches what Augusta National does. I mean, it, but it's really not it's not f a fair comparison because they they likely spend more than most facilities do because it only really has to look good for the Masters. It only has to look good for April. You know what I mean? Um, but it's it's something else. I have I have been before. I've been one time for a practice round, and it's if you like grass, it's worth going just for that reason alone because it's it's like the it's gonna be the best stuff you ever walked on. Like imagine the best grass you've ever seen. And it's better than that. That's probably the best way I can I can say it. So you have to see it in person to really appreciate it. It is it really is that good. It really is that good. All right. Next up is Devin. Devin's in the house. What's going on, man? 
He says, what's up, Ron? 47 days till spring. Look at him counting down, man. That's, that's a real lawn nerd there. He says, can't wait to top dress and get going on the yard. Sadly, we might get five to 10 plus inches tonight. And I guess by that, you mean snow, not rain. He says, I'll take the moisture though. Yeah, yeah, I get it, Devin. I get it. But I mean, here's the thing, man. Just, you know, soon enough, it'll be warming up and you'll be out there top dressing the lawn. You'll, and you'll be asking yourself, why was I looking forward to all this work? But then imagine how awesome it's going to look. I'm really looking forward to seeing how your, uh, how your lawn does. You know, I know you're going to be using all the good stuff on it. So it's going to be interesting to, to hear your feedback, your thoughts once you, once you get going. All right. Next up is Wayne K. Wayne K. He says, uh, hi, Ron. I found a few huge mushrooms in my zoysia. They are not above the grass, but kind of nestled in it. I'm planning on just digging them out before the lawn wakes up, but do I need to do more? No, not really, Wayne. You know, if you want to avoid or make it less likely for you to have mushrooms in your lawn, something that I found, and I didn't really expect this, but it makes sense now that more I think about it, is once I started turf raking my lawn regularly, so throughout the growing season, um, in the mornings, I would wake up and I'd go out and look at the lawn and you'd have mushrooms in it. And then by 10, 11 o'clock, once it got hot, they would, they would die off and just kind of fall over. Right. When I started turf raking the lawn regularly, um, which, you know, keeps debris out of it, you know, keeps thatch levels at manageable levels, like mushrooms were no longer really a thing in my lawn. You know what I mean? Like I actually tested it last year. Like the, so there's, there's two vanity, there's two vanity strips. One that's between like goes from my lawn and turn in front of Alex's lawn. And there's another one that's in right in front of the house. Purposely last year, I ensured that I always like the, the same turf raking schedule that the back lawn, the front lawn, um, got that the version, the, the vanity strip that's between next to Alex and mine that are sh shared. It got the same turf raking. The one that's right in front of my house. I did not. And that's the only area, literally the only spot on my entire lawn, over almost 12,000 square feet, where any mushrooms would ever come in. So that's a, that's something you can consider if you, it's another benefit to turf raking if, you, if you're if you looking for yet another reason to it. I mean, it it, it looks, it makes the, turf, the, the, the lawn look awesome. The stripes look incredible. Um, I have less disease problems in the lawn since I started doing that. And a side benefit is that you don't, you don't have, um, you know, mushrooms really aren't aren't as much of a thing if you you do it regularly. So something to consider. Nothing else that I would say to do. If you're gonna dig them out or get rid of them, that's fine. But I mean, you know, getting rid of that that thatch, that spongy layer that they, that they tend to like to grow in, is gonna be the way to make it not be as much of a problem going forward. So you have to ask yourself if the juice is worth the squeeze to you. Uh, but to me, it is because that's not the only reason the turf rake. You know, just lightly doing that, it it does a lot of a lot of great great stuff for your lawn. You don't have to go too aggressive and it, it really, from an appearance standpoint, it really sets the lawn apart. Really, really, really does. All right, next up is Darmaculus Thompson. He says, greetings, Ron. Turf uh, is getting ready to dominate. Turf raking done this week. Nice. I showed your pictures earlier, Darmaculus. I can show everybody again. So this is his lawn um, after turf raking and this is a close-up. And uh, to not be left out, Jason Harrison, another Golf Course Lawn Academy member, uh, did his lawn, and you can see you got that dormant stripe action going on. I see you. I see you. And you got to have the obligatory shot where you show your lawn and show the lawns right next to you where they are not doing it. It looks good. And again, if not to be left, not to be left out of this, that is um, that is my lawn. That picture was taken uh, this week, so you can see the the results the results of that. So great stuff. All right. Next up is Gerald Jennings. He says. Is Princep offered in a container less than 2.5 gallons? I don't think so, uh, Gerald. I don't believe so. So the active ingredient in Princep is, um, is, is simazine. It's a herbicide called simazine. You might be able to find like a generic version of it that comes in a smaller amount, but I think the the like the brand name, like Syngenta's offering Princep, it only comes in two and a half gallons. I believe that is the case. I've got some in my garage and it's a two and a half gallon uh, jug of it. So I, I don't believe so unless they've recently changed it to where they're offering it in smaller amounts. So hope that, hope that helps. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, let me know. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a good herbicide, but again, like, you know, and that's another thing too, right? So if you do, um, image Princip and, um, Prodiomy, now you're having, you got like three herbicides that you're having to, to have, to have around and, um, they get used up at different rates because Princip, you have enough of it to go to last for years and, image comes in a smaller bottle but yeah the, the idea is if you can if you can swing for it just use spectacle flow it's just it's easier it produces a better result it lasts longer um 
you know, and you don't have a ton of herbs. Like this is an 18 ounce bottle that will last for years. And if you worried about the price, just find someone in your neighborhood or one of your lawn buddies that you can split a bottle with and that will, that will lower it. And then you'll be, you'll get all the benefits with like none of the headaches. You know what I mean? So that is uh that is the way that I would go. So hope that helps Gerald. You need anything else? Don't hesitate to reach out. And the next up is Archie. He says, are you using the rake, uh, Tines or the Scarifier blades? Okay, yeah, so I am using the uh, the rake, the turf rake, not the verticutter. So I don't, here's the thing, I don't know why Alec does it this way, they should just change it. Because like on their website, if you go and you look at their consumer mowers or residential mowers, they call it the Scarifier. And if you go look at the professional mowers, they call the same cartridge, literally the same thing, they call it a turf rake. Why? I do not know. Um, and then the, the the thing that you're talking about with the blades, the fixed blades, the closely, um, closely spaced fixed blades is a verticutter. So I've not heard of a scarifier being referred to as a verticutter. I've heard of a scarifier being referred to as a turf rake. So a verticutter is a verticutter, and then turf rake and scarifier are synonymous. At least the last time I checked, who knows? I may have changed it again. But I mean, that's like surf, turf rake and scarifier you can use interchangeably, and verticutter is a different thing to to both of those. So, uh, so hope that helps, Archie. And what did I use? I use the turf rake slash. In, based on your question, the rake. I use the rake. Yeah, the 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 spring load. Actually, I can show you the spring loaded, the spring loaded tines um, option. Oh yeah, yeah. Where am I? I used this. I used this. See, that guy, turf rake, with the spring loaded. So see, they call it a turf rake here. And if I go over and look at their residential mowers, oh watch, they're gonna make a liar to me. Maybe they changed it. Maybe they finally fixed it. So they call it a turf rake there. But if you come down here and you look at this one, nope, it's now the exact same cartridge is a scarifier. See, so I don't know. I don't have to tell you. So. I use this, not the verticutter, which is um, which is this guy. What you were asking me about is uh, the verticutter, and I don't use that until um, May, May timeframe. This is the verticutter. So this is the the closely spaced blades that you use for verticutting or gently thinning out the turf. So again, I don't know. I'm I'm sure there's a reason for why they why they. I guess maybe this, they already printed up a bunch of documentation. That's why they leave it that way. But um, but yeah, there you go, Archie. All right, uh, next up is Los. Los says, um, uh, hey, Ron, I have Poet Travalis, um on my lawn. It's getting worse. Is it a bad idea to leave it alone and not do anything about it? It depends on the kind of, on your grass, um, Los. I mean, you can, you can try get, looking for a selective herbicide to take care of it. You didn't tell me what kind of grass you have, um, it, it might die off. What you might find is it might die off as, as temps warm up. So it just depends on, um, on like how much it's bugging, how much it's bugging you. If it's, if you, you want to get rid of it, um, look for selective herbicide that's labeled to control it, that's safe for your grass type and use that, uh, use that to take care of it is what I would say. I imagine it's bugging you cause you're asking about it. So hope that helps. Um, Andrew, uh, says I have several sections of my yard that are still green. So I would never apply glyphosate. Yeah, man, I, I can't stress enough. Like the only, the only areas I would ever use glyphosate on a lawn would be, um, or area or on a property would be like mulch beds, sidewalks, driveways, hardscapes, pretty much areas that don't have turf grass because the only benefit, really in my opinion anyway, I mean, people will disagree with me on this, but the only benefits to glyphosate compared to using an appropriate selective herbicide that is safe for your grass type is that it's less expensive, but you're really rolling the dice because if the grass isn't dormant, like you go out there and you go spray, say you go out and spray POA in a Bermuda lawn right now or a zoysia lawn with glyphosate to try and get rid of it, taking like the you know, less expensive route, and then once March, April rolls around, the lawn starts waking up and you start looking at it, you're gonna have dead spots in your lawn that are gonna take, you know, take months to recover from. I, I've seen it, I have seen that happen personally with my own eyes. Like a neighbor that's not that far from me did that a few years back and it was it was bad. I mean, so I I would take it, take it for what you will. Your choice if you want to use glyphosate on your lawn, I would I would highly try to discourage you to not do that. Um, it's just not, in my opinion, just not not worth the risk. It's not worth the risk. All right, next up is uh, John Williams. 
He says, what would be the best fertilizer to apply this coming season? I plan on seeding some cool season grass for the backyard due to shade. Any suggestions on best seed for shaded areas and also what fur to put down? Yeah, so the, the best answer to that question, John, is gonna come from a soil test. So the, the, the question of what is the best fertilizer for my lawn, my soil, really comes down to the data that comes from a uh, from getting a soil test done. So that's this is thing one. This, I would say this is what you would wanna use. Most people, whenever they're establishing a new lawn from seed, they use like a balanced or a complete fertilizer that contains all three macros. So some nitrogen, some phosphorus and potassium. So if you were looking to do that, you could go with uh, this guy here, the complete 14, seven to 14. Like this would be a great option to use uh, for your seeding project. But it, as far as what you would use continually to feed the lawn um, outside of that, really you're gonna wanna have a soil test to, you know, have the results from a soil test to be able to, uh, to tell you that. As far as grass seed goes, um, it, it depends on how much shade you're dealing with. Like I think of the grass types, I think fine fescue does really well in heavily shaded areas. So it depends on how much shade you're talking about. Like fine fescue or a fescue uh, does well. Um, you know, Ryan and KBG can do so all right in somewhat all right in shade. Um, and then warm season grasses like Bermuda are are the worst about it. So zoysia is kind of in between there. Zoysia can do okay with some shade, but if you got heavy shade, then look into a uh, a fescue, like a fine fescue. Like that would be um, that would be the option that I would look at. So hope that helps, sir. And as far as we can get a soil test kit, I will send you a link to that because I'll send you two things. So here's where you can get you find your soil test kit. Um, so at John. Williams, so soil test kits are here. And then as far as the 14714 fertilizer, like what you wanna use as far as your seeding project, which is a great option, then you can get that right here. I will link that to you here in the chat. And fertilizer, if I can type, yeah, there we go. So there's your fertilizer. It's good stuff, man, hope that helps. Um, get a soil test. Um, once you are trying to figure out what you want to use for um, like, you know, your regular applications, like I wouldn't continually keep throwing phosphorus into the soil unless you, your soil test shows that you, you need to do that. Uh, but yeah, that is uh, how I would go about it. Great stuff. And as far as like a particular grass seed, like a manufacturer, I can't really, there's, I mean, Baron Brug makes a really good seed, but there's also a lot of other companies that make great grass seeds. So it just depends on what you're, um, what you're looking for, what you want to go with. All right, so Fernando is up next. Let me get a, a, a his super chat. Almost missed you there, Fernando. Thank you so much for that. Super chat. He says, out Liberty 43, I have a turf, you said turf breaking cartridge. Um, I have a scarifier, cheers. Yeah, so it's on their residential mowers, they call it the turf rake. No, that's not true. On the residential mowers, they call it the scarifier, as I just showed you. And on the pro mowers, they call it the turf rake. And I guess it's maybe because they just printed up a bunch of documentation that had Scarifier on the one and Turf Rake on the other one, I don't know. Because it makes no sense to me as to why the same company would use, would call the same thing two different things. But whatevs, as long as you uh, you know what you're using, you're, you're good to go. Thank you so much for the super chat, Fernando. I do appreciate it. All right, uh, next up we have uh, Chantel. Chantel, she says, what's up, Ron? Like button engaged. Thank you so much, Chantel, I really appreciate that. So guys, we got, yeah, we're doing we're doing better on the likes now, which is good. I like that. Thank you guys so much. It really does mean a lot. You make you make you make me feel happy. It's a good. It's a it's a small thing, but it really does mean a lot. So thank you guys for uh, for engaging with the like button, with the like button. All right. Uh, next up, we have um, Jason Harrison. He says. Um, that pest control from Miramichi is the truth. I sprayed it every three to four weeks last summer. Dramatically less annoying bugs. Yep, it's a great product. I uh, I really do like it. I'm glad that Miramichi Green allowed us to carry it and offer it to the DIY space. It's a it's a great um, uh, it's a great product. And then now let's see. Okay, long guy says if you have quality turf grass, you don't need to use uh, chemicals to kill weeds. But quality grass keeps the weeds at bay. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, the like I I even say that um, on you know, like one of our most popular blog posts is on like how to kill weeds without killing grass, right? And in that, in that, and I've said this on the live stream as well too, is really herbicides, you know, at least the post with herbicides anyway, are are designed, like best used in my opinion, to buy your buy you time. You know what I mean? To get to get ahead of the weeds, to to to, to get rid of the, the plants that you don't want, to allow the plant that you do want, your grass, to become the dominant the dominant one in the uh in the lawn, right? So yeah, one of the, the best weed control you can 
you can have over time is to grow a healthy thick stand of grass, right? But for many people don't have that and to, to get there, you know, you have to meet people where they are, where they are. Some people have like a, a lawn that looks like a weed patch. And in that case, you know, herbicides are a great tool to clean that up and allow you to start the process of, um, of getting ahead of the game. So appreciate the comment. It's a good, good point. Uh, next up, we got John Williams. He says, hit the like button and subscribe. Best lawn channel around. Thanks, Ron, for the clean content. I appreciate that. I try my best, man. I try my best. I mean, here's the thing. I do talk about, here's the thing, John. I do talk about like other football teams other than the Georgia Bulldogs. So I don't know how clean you can really say it is. I mean, you start talking about like, you know, that team in Alabama and the one in, Cle in no, I almost said it. The one that's in like South Carolina, that's, that's orange. And the ones in Tennessee is also, if you start talking about that, I mean, it, can you really say the content is clean at that point? You have to say it's kind of questionable. So I, I'd say it's like PG-13. We start talking about anything other than the Georgia Bulldogs, right? But I appreciate it. I appreciate the, con the, the kind words. Really means a lot. All right, next up is... LG, he says, Archie, I'm awake, but I have to be <laughs> talking about clean content. I have to be my probation officer for the next hour or so. I'll be a bit quiet until then. Okay. Uh, Granger is in the house. He says, um, he says, uh, is, hi, Ron, is there a benefit to using Miramichi Green Triple Four and the Essential G at the same time or just one of them? Yeah, there is, uh, Granger. That's a great question. So, um, while the, while the, the, the triple four, um, does have a microbial package, so it is, it is a biosimilant, essential G contains compost and more importantly, it also contains biochar, which the triple four doesn't. So one of them is a fertilizer and one of them is a biosimilant. So you can, you can use both of them. You're not really overlapping. It's not like one can replace the other. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, there is a, um, there's a good reason to use both because they do, they do different things. That's a great question. And for that, sir, if you're so interested, you will be our Miramichi Green uh, question of the week. So if you want one of these uh, shirts, make sure you hit the right button. If you want one of these shirts, one of the greatness from the ground up t-shirts, one of these guys right here, all you have to do is send me an email to ron at golfcourselon.com. I think you have my email already, but if not, just send me an email. So Ron at golfcourselon.com and I will tell you how you can claim your very own greatness from the ground up t-shirt. It's a great question. That's a good one. And to answer it, yes, you can use them both together. You're not double dipping by doing that. There's no problem at all. And let me make a note here so I can tell who the person was. Question of the week. So cool, Granger. Congrats. Congrats on winning. Great, uh, great question. And um, yes, you can use them both. Okay, next up, we got Mark Romano. He said, that's funny. I'm not sure which part, Mark. I'm, I said a lot of stuff. I mean, sometimes some people just say my face is funny. You know, I don't know. I'm not sure what I, I said that's funny, but okay, I'll take it. Uh, Jacob Madrid is up next. He says, uh, happy Friday, Ron. The Shop Action Gang received rain all over here in Arizona. Uh, he says, hoping to get some pre merger down this weekend. I am late according to the soul attempts. It's okay, Jake. Here's the thing, man. It's, it's still better. It's, it's, so anyone that's watching this, so you're watching this live stream in March or heaven forbid, April, right? It's, is there, there's still going to be benefit to getting your pre-emergent out. I mean, like you want to, is it going to be as good as if you'd done it when the timing is ideal? No, but it's still better than, than not doing it at all. You know what I mean? So, you know, even if you're, you're a week or so behind, not ideal, you're not going to get as good control but it's it's still better. Like I would not throw, <laughs> I would not throw your hands up and be like, oh well, you know, nope, I, I got it. I'm a week or two late. You know, the pre-emergent is just gonna, you know, I just may as well just, just let it all, let it all go now. You know, there's no um, no uh, no 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 point in even trying. No point in even trying. Uh, thanks. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 one second here. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. There we go. Okay. Uh, next up, we got we showing our grass lawn care LLC. He says, um, uh, "Does pre-emergent prevent Dallas grass?" I don't believe so. Like a lot, of, I, don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, we showing our grass. You have to look at the label and see. Um, every summer, it's a problem, and I use Prodiamine Bermuda grass located in North Mississippi. So the thing you'd want to do, we showing our grass, is to just dig it out. So if you got Dallas grass in your lawn, like physically remove it. Um, and if you if you do that over time, um, it's going to become less and less a problem. Like there's not 
Unfortunately, there's not really a post-emergent herbicide that you're supposed to use on residential lawns to control Dallas grass. And I don't know that prodiamine is labeled to control it. I don't believe it is. Um, so the thing is, when you see it, dig it out. Like don't, don't take, I mean, you can take the route of going and putting glyphosate on it, but you just, that's just ba like a band-aid approach. Like physically remove it. And if you do that over time, it'll become less and less of a problem in, in the lawn. So hope that helps, sir. Sorry you're dealing with that. Dallas grass stinks. And if you need anything else, uh, let me, let me know. It's a good, that's a good one. Dallas grass is a nasty one. It's a nasty one. Actually, you know, one of my, one of my buddies has a spray business. He says, you know what, dude, it's, I, I won't, if I go to a customer's lawn, they have Dallas grass all throughout it. I won't even take it on because if I tell them they got to dig stuff out, they're not going to want to do it. And they're just going to keep calling me back all the time. And there's not a whole lot I can do about it. So, um, if you're dealing with that, just dig it out. Don't, um, you know, I mean, some people say like tribute total can, can be effective against it, but really just, just remove it. That's, that's the way to go. All right, next up is Stephen uh, Thompson. Nope, that was not for me. Uh, Brew for Cuckoo's Fishing says, um, hey, Ron, happy Friday. Smash that like button. Thank you so much, um, Brew for Cuckoo's Fishing. Next up is Melvin Otta. He says, hey, Ron, should I plan on to apply prodiamine uh, 65 WG? So you're planning on doing that. Okay. He says, should I do the full ratio or split half and half this weekend and the other half the end of the month? Uh, so I can tell you what I do, Melvin. Um, Either approach can work. Either strategy can work. You can do a single application, which is what I tend to do. I tend to apply prodiamine at, towards the heavier um, end of the application uh, rate, and I, that produces great results for me. And there are some people that prefer to do split apps, in which case you would do one now, and you would do another one in like late March, early April timeframe. So you wouldn't do an application now and then do another one at the end of February. So right as I am saying this, it's February 2nd. So if you did one now, you'd wait till like late March, early April to do your second uh, pre-emergent app. So it really depends on you, which way which way you wanna go. I do a single app at a heavier rate and that served me well. But if you wanna do a split app, you can too. But you need to space it out more so than 28 days is what I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to. All right, uh, good question. Good, 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 good question. So yeah, just depends on you. Depends on you whether it's your, whether that's your your thing. But more, it needs to be more than 28 days apart if that's uh, that's what you're going for. Okay, next up is uh, Chantel. Chantel is in the house. She says, I think Chantel was from Florida. I think I remember you from last year, I believe. You sa she says, uh, gut soil test, yikes. That's what she said. She said like that. She says, yikes. Uh, N and K are riding low. I've never heard it referred to that way. I've heard, oh, my, my N and K are devastatingly low. I got the worst soil forever. Like, you know, my ground is forsaken. But I've never heard... N and K are riding low. It's kind of like, you, usually you're trying to take something that's, that's not great and making it sound cool. I dig it, it's riding low. Looking forward to implementing your spoon feeding, plan the season, asking late, but any issues with applying pre and post emergent in the same tank? There's not a Chantel, I've done it. Um, but what, here's what I would say. If you're gonna do a pre emergent and a post emergent, um, you can get a good result with that. What I would say is that you wanna avoid um, I, surfactant, like the couple times that I've done that, I've omitted the surfactant. And the reason for that is this, you think about the pre-emergent, the pre-emergent really, you don't want it sticking to the, the, the leaf or the skin of the plant. You want it in the soil. And a surfactant like this, like the, the, the high yield is a spreader sticker, meaning it's going to help it um, coat the leaf of the plant and it's gonna help it adhere to it. So you're kind of working against yourself if you are using a surfactant along with a pre-emergent. So if you're gonna go that route to save time, which is why I've done it, um, here's how I would go about it. Um, you would, you'd mix, let's say you're doing Celsius certainty and prodiamine, right? Because that's what I've done before. So Celsius certainty and prodiamine. What you would do is you would mix them all up at the correct rates, you would spray it, you'd spray the lawn, and then you would not water it in until a day or so later. I mean, at, at the earliest the following day, but really if you wanna wait two days before you run irrigation, that would be fine too. Because the idea is you want to give the um, the post-emergent herbicide, like Celsius Uncertainty, enough time to be taken up by the, the plant, the weed that you're targeting. And because we're not using surfactant with it, if you can give it a full day, maybe even two, uh, that would be that would be the way that I would go. That's what I've done for my not this not Alice, but the other neighbor several years back, and it worked well. It worked well. So the big thing is you just can't you um you can't go out there and spray that combination and then go run irrigation right after the fact. You kind of you're working against yourself if you do that. So if you can mix post-emergent herbicides with pre-emergent, like you're not going to want to run irrigation the same day 
um, or really even earlier the next day. If you want, you want to give it like a full 24 hours, maybe, so if you, in other words, if you do this on a Monday morning, if you wanted to wait till Wednesday morning to, to run your irrigation to water the pre-immersion in, that would produce a, that would produce a pretty good result for you. That's how I would go about doing it. So hope that helps. I mean, and again, if you want the best way is just to not do it that way, right? Spray the pre-immersion by itself, run irrigation, water it in, and then spray the, the post-immersion by itself. So like mix whatever you're gonna be using. I'm assuming you got warm shoes and grass, so mix like Celsius certainty surfactant and spray that, and that is gonna produce the absolute best result, right? Because you're using um, also the proper spray tip for each product because with, with pre-emergent, you're gonna wanna use a, a larger droplet spray tip, which is what I use. When I did that combination you're talking about, I use a larger droplet spray tip, not the foliar tip. Um, so for pre-emergent, you wanna use this, whereas for post-emergent herbicides to produce the best result, you want a finer droplet. So uh, unless you got a really big lawn or you just don't have the time, um, like doing them separately is gonna produce a better result. But if you, you know, if that's your case, hey, I don't got the time to do it or I just don't want to do it, then you can, you can do that. It's just not as good. So hope that helps. Great question. Um, and hopefully my explanation made sense to you. It can work. It's just, you have to be just more cognizant about when you want, when water is gonna be coming, when you're gonna like water the lawn or rainfall is gonna be coming. Especially since you're not gonna have the surfactant to really you know, help the, the post immersion work as well as it could. All right, uh, next up is Dan Lynch. He says, hey Ron, thanks for staying on top of my essential G order. I put out 20 pounds per thousand square feet today. Look at you, man. It's a great initial rate. Is it okay to keep putting it out that rate and then stop during the summer? Sure, yeah, I mean, you're not gonna, you're not gonna really gonna hurt anything. I mean, a good, like a good maintenance rate that most people will stick to is half that. They do like 10 pounds per thousand. But if you want to keep doing 20 pounds per thousand between now and say April and then switch to, to 10 pounds per thousand, there's no uh, no negative to that at all, Daniel. No, you're not, you're not going to hurt anything. No problem at all. If you got enough of it to be able to do that, then by all means, proceed. Not gonna, you're not going to damage anything at all. It's a great question. Again, sorry for, um, I know there's a little bit of delay on you getting your stuff to you, but it was just the time of year and delays at the warehouse and this kind of thing. But it, um, at least you got it. You have it now and you're good to go to build up that soil health, right? Nice stuff. All right, next up is No Name. He says, happy Friday, Ron, and fellow lawn enthusiasts. The season starts now. Let's get those likes up. Let's do that. We got Mark Luna saying, uh, happy Friday. Everyone hit, the, hit that like button. <laughs> Robert Rainey says, I'm on a trackpad. Okay, I, I, here's the thing. I, what's wrong with the trackpad, man? I mean, I think, um, you know, isn't that what they call, isn't that what it's called on laptops now? I mean. Or is that the, what is, what was the, the, do you guys already, I'm probably showing my age here, but any of you guys remember like the older laptops where they had the nub, like the little nub in between, where would it, it used to be between like G, like in the corner and the center of like G, H, T and Y on the keyboard. Like IBM used to have that little red nub, um, like the little mini mouse pointer built in. They don't do those anymore. At least I don't think so. I haven't had a PC in forever, so I don't, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, trackpad, man. Throw a trackpad, trackpad, mouse. You know, your pointing device, whatever your pointing device happens to be, move said pointing device towards the like, or if you don't like it, dislike button, and hit one of the two of them. Whichever, whichever is, uh, is your thing. He says trackball, old, trackball, old school, that is old school. That is old school, man. You take it out and wipe it off every now and then, you trackball, wow. Okay, okay, Robert, you're showing your age there, man. All right, King Con says, we are in the building. Greeting Lawn Brothers. Uh, thank you so much, um, King Con. And next, and then Peter says, sorry, I guess Bermuda, thanks for the info. You're welcome, Peter. Uh, I figured as much, but I, you know, I, I got it. I'll just put the disclaimer in there. If it's Bermuda, then you can do this. If it's not Bermuda, do not use certainty on your lawn unless you really hate Poe enough to damage part of your lawn in the process. It's really your call. All right, uh, next up, <laughs> next up is James Smith. He says, if you're having a problem with Poa, should change to a different IPA? I guess. Um, by IPA, do you mean beer? Like the, like the beer type? Yeah, I don't know, man. I like, I'm not a big IPA fan. I like stouts. Like, I like Guinness. It's like a very popular beer where I grew up. I guess, like, beer, stout, whatever. That's what I, that's what I like to drink. It's like liquid bread, right? All right, Matt Brown is up next. He says, Ron, my Bermuda grass is getting its butt kicked with winter this weeds. I'm in LA. Need help. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, Bermuda, here's the thing. Bermuda might be taken, you know, I'm getting a little knocked about, but come summertime, it should it should wake back up and, and assert dominance. Uh, what I would say, Matt, is if you are looking to get rid of the weeds that are in your lawn now, uh, 
you can use a selective combination that I really like um, called Celsius and Certainty. So I'll show you really quick here. And it's what I, I consider to be a, one of the best combinations to use on warm season grass because you can spray it now when temperatures are cooler all the way into summertime when temperatures are hotter because there's not really a temperature restriction on either of the two herbicides. So as long as you mix it at the correct rates, you know, you're, you're highly unlikely to damage the Bermuda while still getting excellent control against the weeds that you're targeting. So I'll show you what I'm talking about here. If you go to the Golf Course Lawn Store and you go to shop and then you go to Weed Killer, which is what you have a problem with, weeds, right? Um, and the very first option is this, is the Celsius Certainty Herbicide Kit, which comes with several things. You get Celsius, which is a broadleaf herbicide, which controls, as the name would imply, broadleaf weeds. Then you have Certainty, which is great for Kalinga, Sedges, um, and Poannua. Um, and then you have like, it's it's uh, it's backup. They're 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 uh, they're, they're co-stars. They're kind of supporting casts for these two. So Celsius and Certainty are the herbicides, and then um, the spreader sticker is a surfactant that you mix along with these two that helps the herbicide coat the leaf of the plant better and also helps it adhere to it, so you get a better result. And then finally is the marker dye, which uh, if you spray this mixture without any kind of a colorant, it's clear. You're not gonna really be able to see it um, on your lawn. So if you're spraying the lawn, you wanna be able to see what you spray, what you haven't sprayed, then you can use marker dye. So certainty, Celsius, surfactant, marker dye. This is the combination that I would use for cleaning up weeds in warm season turf because you can use it now and again into the summertime. And to make things easier for you, if you scroll down here to, I'm uh, not here, to, um, to how to use, I think, uh, where is it? Maybe I've got it under product detail. Um, yeah, there's a video. There's a video that I filmed at this point, it's been almost three years now, that talks about how to kill weeds and not kill your grass. And it features this very combination, Celsius, Certainty, Surfactant, and Marker Dye. It shows you how one way that to mix it is not the only way to mix it, but it's how I like to do it. Um, so there's videos in the product description that will help you get a great result with controlling weeds in your warm season lawn. I mean, this 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 combo combo again, you know, outside of like Dallas grass, which which certainty is labeled to suppress, but I mean, it's really if you got Dallas grass, dig it out is what I would tell you. Um, but as far as like having control over sedges, poa, and broadleaf weeds, like this is a great combo, great combo that you can use again. Um, from over a broad temperature range. So that is what I would use to get rid of weeds in your Bermuda lawn that by your own words is getting its butt kicked this time of year. So that is what I would go with. So at Matt Brown, uh, this is uh, the kit. Certain uh, Celsius. Okay, uh, there you go. That's what I would go with. And again, it's for warm season grass only. Do not use that on cool season grass. We have one for cool season grass and it's labeled at the very top cool season grass. So you, you can tell once it's warm season, once it's cool season. So make sure you use the appropriate one for your grass type. All right, Ahmad Jones is up next. He says, should I scout my lawn now? It's up to you, Ahmad. I don't know where you are in the country. Um, if you want to do a bit of a cleanup now, like a light cleanup now, then you can. I've I've done that in the past. I mean, you could, you could almost say, like what I've done here with turf raking, it's not, I didn't really lower the height of cut because it pretty much stayed the same. But as far as um, getting debris out of the lawn, you could say that I've been, I've started doing that, right? I'm getting ready for my pre-emergent app and that all that debris, all that garbage came out of my lawn uh, this week. So if you want to, you can go light, you can do a light um, scalp now. And then, you know, before, right before the season's about to get going, like, March time frame, you could go on really, if, you, if you're planning to do a, a height of cut reset, you could do it then. But it all depends on where you are in the country. Oh, and the next comment you said so. He says, I'm in Memphis and it's 70 degrees today. Wow, it's hot there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I would do the main, like the primary one now, but if you want to do a bit of a cleanup, you absolutely can, Ahmad. I, it's, it's really up to you. Again, scalping your lawn is optional. It is optional. It's not something you have to do, um, but it's um, there's a lot of benefits to it. Again, you, you're cleaning a lot of, you know, all the, a lot of the debris that, that tends to build up over time out of your lawn. And probably the reason why a lot of people like to do it is that your lawn greens up sooner than lawns that are not scalped. And I'm trying to find a, I think I, I'm pretty sure I read a blog post on this topic. There we go. This is the one. Talks about the, the answers the very question of, should you scalp your lawn in the early spring? So I'll show you right here. So there's an entire blog post on that very topic. I'm on, should you scalp your lawn in the early spring? Um, it shows like the technique that I like to use when I do uh, scalping to kind of make things less painful. I'm um, like, what scalping is, when to scalp your lawn, can any grass be scalped, what kind of grass you should not scalp, what height you should set your height to cut to, all this kind of stuff. So 
To help you out with that, to give you even more detail other than what I just said, I will link this for you in the chat. This blog post on lawn scalping. Let's see, lawn scalping in spring. Uh, so there you go. So take a look at that. Hopefully you find it useful. It was fun to write and see, it's actually useful right now, right? It's one of those things, it's kind of a niche thing, but when it's useful, it's useful. And right now it's useful based on your question. All right, uh, next up we have Dan Lynch. Actually, let me make sure I'm not missing anyone because every time I scroll down, I, I tend to end up in the wrong in the wrong spot. Um, so a question here on Instagram. This one says, just tuned in, when is the best time to put down lime? Ideally in the fall, you know, so if you would do a soil test in the fall and you would um, apply lime then because it gives your lawn, it gives the soil adequate time for the lime to react and bring the pH levels up. The second best time is today. So if your, your soil tests show that you need lime, you should apply it now. You know, I mean, again, assuming you live, like, can you qualify that? Assuming you live in an area where the ground isn't frozen, so if you live somewhere where there's not a bunch of snowfall, then yeah, obviously you don't apply lime. But if you live somewhere in the Southeast United States where, you know, temperatures are relatively mild this time of year, uh, then yeah, you want to get your lime app down, uh, go ahead and do that. I mean, because lime does take uh, longer than like, say, like your macros to, 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 re to reflect um, a change in soil pH levels. Like the, the fastest that I've seen when I was doing there's a year when I did soil testing every quarter just to see how quickly um, a lime application would, would react with the soil and make a change. And what I came up with was like three to four months. And it may have been sooner, but I did a test. I did a test in June and I did another one the end of September, early October. It's so like a three, four month period between when I applied it and then when I tested again. And I, did, I noticed a noticeable difference in um, the pH levels. So the, the, you did see a, a noticeable bump. So I would, I would do it now. If you, if again, if you had a time machine, August, September last year would have been better, but next second best time is today. So hope that helps. And then one other question, one other point, um, Renzo, you didn't ask this, but uh, it, I'm assuming you have a soil test. That's why you're applying lime. But lime comes in two major varieties. There's calcitic lime and a dolomitic lime. If you, of those two, if you look at your soil test results and your magnesium levels are low, then you're gonna to wanna to go with a dolomitic lime. And if your magnesium levels are fine, then go with calcitic because dolomitic lime has more magnesium in it. Like when you've got a, a dolomitic lime product, it tends to have more magnesium. So you can, you kind of kill two birds with one stone, right? You're raising the uh, the pH levels and you're also raising your uh, magnesium levels. So that's one thing I tell you to look at on your, your soil test. If your magnesium levels are low, go with dolomitic. If your magnesium levels are fine, go with calcitic. So good stuff. And then as far as application rate, 20, 20 to 40 pounds per thousand is what I would um, is what I would go with. I don't know where your pH is or anything like that, but 20 to 40 is a good number. All right, uh, next up we have um, we got Dan Lynch. He says he says um, <laughs> to clarify, I'm ultimately going to end up with 80 pounds per thousand by the time I use up this giant bag I bought. Uh, yeah, I mean it's not going to hurt anything. You're putting plenty of organic material in there. It's not going to be any problem. Um, at all, Dan. No worries at all there. All right. Next up, we have. Let me see. It's a good thing I came back, Dan, because I missed your other your other comment. Uh, next, we have. We did a med. We have James. James Smith. He says. Uh, he says if you're into doing the work, grab something like Weber grilling thermometer to get a rough idea of, of your soil temp and record your numbers. Uh, to average versus the number of web app sources using an, a region average. Uh, sure, yeah, you could do that. I mean, if you have, I think I've got one here. Yeah, if you got one of these guys, I mean, a meat thermometer, like what James is saying will work well too. But if I've got one of these, um, which you could find on Amazonia, I think is where I got this. Um, but yeah, you could you could measure, you go out there and measure yourself and then you know exactly what your soil temps are. I mean, if you're gonna do that though, make sure you set it to the same depth each time and that you do it around the same time of day. And uh, and yeah, yeah, you, you can do that and compare it against what the what the online tools, uh, what the online tools say. But I mean, they're, they're pretty close. I mean, it's they're, they're getting close enough for government work, close enough for, for our purposes, is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, if you got the time, go for it. All right, next up is Jake uh, Weisler. He says, hey, Ron, quick question from Central Florida. How would one manage pre-emergent applications when their soil temps don't really dip below 55 degrees in Augustine lawn, mid 60s to 70s soil temps? Yeah, so I, what I've heard is that some folks in Florida will, will apply pre-emergent almost like quarterly, 
right? Um, I don't live in Florida, um, but if you, you know, the, you figure that a, depending on the pre-emergence you're using, you get about three to four months of control out of it, right? So if you did a fall pre-emergent app, um, then really around now is when it's starting to fall off. So if you're somewhere where it just, the soil temps just never really get cooler, meaning that weeds are kind of like a, a year round thing, then I would time it based on how long the pre-emergent is, is designed to last, which for diphyopyr or prodiamine um, is typically like three to four months. So that's, that is how I would, uh, I would approach that. Now, if you're using something like Spectacle Flow in the fall, so say September you did like a, um, what's the high rate for Spectacle? It's like eight ounces per acre, I think. I have to check level. Anyway, if you're using Spectacle at the, higher, at the higher rate, then you can really get, I mean, the label says up to 10, mount, 10 months of coverage, but really like six months is what I would say. I wouldn't really stretch it much past that. So if you did Spectacle in late August, early September, then February, late February-ish timeframe, you could go out there and you, know, you could do your, your prodiamine or whatever you decided to use for your, your spring pre-emergent. So hope that helps, Jake, it's a great question. Um, I would just go by based on how long the pre-emergent is gonna be effective for in a place where, you know, soil temps don't really, are always, are pretty much always uh, warmer. So pretty much where weeds are germinating year round is, is your question. All right, Robert Wallace, he says, hey, happy Friday, Ron. Just wondering if you do a split application or do you go with the full rate for prodiamine? I go with the full rate. I go 0 0.80 ounces one time around this time of year. And that's what I've done for, for several years. So, I mean, and again, it's not necessarily the thing it's the only way to do it. It produces a good result for me. Like I've done that for years now and it, and it works great. Works great in my, in my case. Um, if you wanna do a split up, you can. You can plan to do one now and then do another one in uh, in april if you uh if you so desire it's really really up to you kind of like um spectacle like in not this past fall but in what year are we in 2024 last year 20. so from 2022 to 2023 i did spectacle flow at the heavy rate um in early september right so like so 0 0.20 ounces um per thousand square feet in september and that worked great for me. Like I didn't have any POA, any breakthrough in the spring of last year. This year, because people kept asking, hey, what happens if you do the split app? Is it gonna work better or worse? Just, just for that reason, just to test it, I did a split app and the results are pretty much the same, right? So I've got, like, I didn't have much of a breakthrough with POA. I applied it in sept uh, late August, early September. And I did the second app in um, the beginning of December, I think, if memory serves me. Um, and the results are, are pretty much the same. So for me, I don't like to do a bunch of work that I don't have to. And if I get a good result with Prodiamine, or, or in my case, I've gotten a great result with Prodiamine doing a single app at the heavier rate um, around this time of year. So that's why I just do that, right? But keep in mind too, I also do everything I can to maximize that Prodiamine application working as well as it does. So like in years past before I had the Allet, I would do what was called like a pre-scalp, right? So like kind of cleaning some of the debris out to, to ensure that as much of the prodiamine gets to the soil as possible. Now that I have another tool, a better tool for being able to do that without having to scalp the lawn, like the turf rake, I just lightly do that. And this is what I did last year and I get a great result as well too. So it's it's really your preference, Robert. In my case, a single app at the higher rate has worked well. So that's why I don't change it because it just means more work for no, really no good reason in my case. So hope that helps. Great question. Uh, next up we have, um, so I'm glad it was useful, John. And then next up is RV18 says, hey Ron, what breaks up pre-emergent barrier like verticutting, turf raking, thanks. Uh, if you're doing ver uh, turf raking properly, it shouldn't. And if you're doing verticutting properly, it shouldn't because in neither case should the tool be getting into the dirt. You shouldn't be touching the dirt in either case if you're doing those. You know, you should be setting up the, 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 the equipment to where it's two to four millimeters above the surface of the soil. And if you're doing that, then it really shouldn't affect the pre-emergent barrier. Again, I turf raked and verticut all year last year, and I didn't have a bunch of breakthrough, a bunch of weeds in my lawn or anything like that. Uh, the thing that's probably the most, I mean, that would, that you could say that if anything's gonna cause um, your a degradation in your pre-emergent is gonna be something like core aeration. So when you're literally punching holes in the soil, like two to four inch plugs and pulling those out, like, yeah, that's going to, that's that's going to disturb the barrier, and you could see uh, an increase in uh, in in breakthrough as far as like weeds coming in your lawn if you were to core aerate. But if you're turf turf raking and verticutting and the, the machine is set up properly, it should not. So hope that helps, RV. It's a great question. As far as um, is turf raking gonna or or um, verticutting gonna do it? And in my if you set it up properly, it should not. Shouldn't shouldn't be a problem. 
Shouldn't be, um, shouldn't cause a bunch of issues to where you turf rake and then three weeks later, you got crab grass going everywhere. And that's, that shouldn't be a thing. All right, next up is Victor Gonzalez. He says, uh, blah, blah, blah. he says, hey Ron, quick question. Is there an affordable real mower in the market uh, that you would recommend? The outlet is outside of my budget. I only have been using the Ryobi mower for three years. I have a Bermuda lawn. Depends what you define as affordable. So if you're looking for a brand new real mower, um, there's a lot of good options, man. I mean, that, that new revolution from real rollers, I think is gonna, gonna hit pretty well. That's a, I mean, it's got a lot, for, for what you pay compared to mowers in that price category. So like if you're comparing like True Cut or McLean or Trimmer, um, I think the revolution has a lot going for it. Uh, and if you're buying a brand new one, I, I don't think, I think like $2,700, $2,800, whatever they are. Um, so if you're buying brand new, then like that is where I would look. If you are looking, if you're fine with pre-owned, then you could look into greens mowers. Like if, I mean, if, if, if quality of cut is the criteria that you care most about and you're willing to tolerate a bit of inconvenience and like more expensive parts if something breaks, then like a greens mower, whether it be like a Greens Master 1600 or one of the John Deere real mowers, like that's gonna produce, like that's gonna produce the best cut. Like the best cutting mower that I have um, is my Greens Master. The best striping mower I have is the Allet by far. Like it, it lays stripes like nobody's business, but as far as like the quality of cut, like my Greens Master 1600 with the 11 blade reel is, it's a thing of beauty. It's a thing of beauty, but it's again, but it's more expensive to fix if something, if it breaks, um, and parts are more expensive. Uh, there's a little bit less, they're a bit less convenient to move around than other real mowers. So it just really depends on what you're after. Pre-owned, you could go Greens mower. If you're looking for brand new, then the um, then that new revolution by real real rollers is a good idea. Um, and then once you start getting into interchangeable cartridge system mowers, then that's when the price really starts to go up, right? So um, I know there's some new ones coming out this year, but once you start getting into the ones from Allet, you're talking. And then you're talking like five, six grand or more, you know. So they, it just gets expensive once you start once you start going for an interchangeable cartridge system. But I will tell you this, Victor, um, you know, <laughs> like if you looked at my if you look at my content, and because the, the proof's in the pudding, right? If you look at my content of my lawn from like three years ago, right, how the lawn looked then, which I think looks pretty good, and then you look at it in the last um, since tw when did I get the the outlet? Twenty twenty. What is twenty twenty four? Twenty three. 20, I think twenty twenty two is when I got it. So in the summer of twenty two onward, if you look at the quality of the turf from twenty twenty two to now, it's not not even close. I mean, the lawn looked great, but it's just like a it's like another level of awesomeness, and a lot of that comes from like the turf raking and verticutting. So a lot of the cultural practices you're able to do when you have a piece of equipment that can do that. So. If you're coming from, like, sometimes you're coming from a Ryobi, from you're coming from a rotary mower, any powered real mower that you get is going to be a night and day difference. Like, you're not going to believe, like, how much of a difference it's going to make. But, like, once you do that for a while and you're saying, what else is out there? Like, how much better can this get? If you can start introducing, like, verticutting once a month throughout the, the growing season, like, spring, summer months, and, and turf raking, it really does make a difference, man. I mean, like, the, again, you don't have to take my word for it. Like, literally, all my, all my content's still online. Go look at the videos from, like, you know, 2020 and look at everything from like 2022 onward and you can look at the lawn and you can see for yourself which one looks better. You know what I mean? It's, and it's the only difference. I mean, there's been a, like small tweaks to the new ship program here and there, but the biggest difference is the cultural practices, right? Is the verticutting and turf raking. So just something to consider. But if you're gonna, if all you care about is a mower, then, and you want a brand new one, get the, I say the Revolution 26. And if you want something around that same price, but it will, that maybe, or maybe a little bit cheaper, then you could go with a greens mower. But again, I haven't, I haven't priced them lately. They might be the same or more expensive than Revolution, even pre-owned, so there you go. Um, John says the order of the 14714 is done, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, John, I really do appreciate that. And then next up we have James Smith. He says, hmm, only 124 uh, lookers and only 94 thumbs up. Can't we do better? We've done better, John James. They've come around. They've come around. The begging and pleading. He said, I ain't too proud to beg, TLC. I ain't too proud to beg. I mean, the, all the begging and groveling and saying how much it really means to me. They've, they've taken pity on this poor lawn care YouTuber and said, you know what? I mean, he's, a, he's really not that good, but you know, it's the best we got right now. So we'll just we'll give, him, give him a like. We'll, we'll do that, right? So they've come around, James. All right, next up is Stephen Thompson. He says, any budget-friendly turf rakes, Ron? Yes, so there is the, um, what's the one? It's a, the battery-powered one, and they make a, it's also 
one that plugs with the wall, like uh, the Sunjo. And there's another company that makes, I think, pretty much the same thing, but it's a different, um, I think, is it Earthwise? Maybe Earthwise makes one. I know Sunjo makes one, um, but there's another company that also makes them as well, too. And if you go with one of those, yes, you can you can get a good result with turf breaking. I mean, if you look at here, this is, you want to see the example of what, of what it can do. Like this is Jason's lawn, Jason, and that, he doesn't have an outlet. He's got, I think one of those Sun Joes, are, and you look, did a great job. I mean, so that's that's his, and then this is uh, mine. And the biggest difference between those two, I mean, they're basically equivalent. The biggest difference is that this piece of equipment weighs maybe, I don't know, 30 pounds, 40 pounds, you know what I mean? And then this piece of equipment weighs like 300 plus pounds. So that's why you see the difference in definition and stripes. But for the purposes of what you're after, which is removing like lightly and safely removing debris from the lawn, uh, that will work well too. So, and I, I wanna say that those also come with a cartridge you can use for verticutting too. I wanna say so, but I mean, Jason, if you're still here, you can chime in or just, just check their, you know, check the product page or whatever, because I think they come, I know they come with like a turf rake, but I believe they also come with a cartridge you can swap out that you can use for verticutting. So there are there are less expensive ways of getting a verticutter and turf rake than buying, you know, an expensive piece of equipment. So just, there's, there's ways to do it. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps, Steven. Uh, Chris Miller is in the house and he says, um, Hey Ron, my side yard is bare dirt thanks to the utility company doing work. That's not fun. I have an Arden 15 yard. Can I plug from other parts of my yard now or should I wait until it greens up? I'm in Northeast Oklahoma. I would wait, I would wait. You know, if you've uh, if you got Arden 15, unfortunately you can't really get any more of it, uh, but I would do it whenever the lawn is um, is beginning to grow. So I don't know in Oklahoma when you guys wake up, but I'd imagine March timeframe, March, April timeframe. That's when I would look into moving plugs from the part of the lawn that's doing well to the area that, you know, is suffering because of the utility work that, that happened. And then it, in, it's, it's Bermuda. If you do that and you got plenty of sunlight and heat, it will take off and spread like wildfire. So no, uh, no issues there. <laughs> Our fragrance journey was like, whoa, 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 roll tide. Here's the thing, though, you know, not to, not to talk trash now. What you guys gonna do now? You know, you know, Sabin is he said enough. He's done. What's Bama gonna do? I don't. I haven't been following that closely to know if they've announced a new. Actually, have they announced a new head coach? They probably have already. I don't, I'm not sure who's gonna be, but I mean, you guys, y'all gotta see, man. Old, old Saint Nick is in there anymore. You guys are gonna have to. We're gonna have to see now. Was it him? Or was it the team? You know what I mean? Kind of like, you know, with the Patriots, was it Brady or was it Belichick? And I mean, Belichick's an awesome coach. I'm not, I mean, I can't do what he does, right? I'm not throwing shade. But I think most people would argue that it was Brady because Brady left and the Patriots have not been that great. And he went in Tampa and won a Super Bowl the first year. So you can't really, you have to say that he was the thing. So it's gonna be interesting to see with the, with the, like the coaching staff and everyone that's left over um, at, at um, that team that is not the, Georgia Bulldogs, um, if they, you know, how they do this next upcoming season. So we'll see. And we'll see. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it should be a good time. All right, next up is Mark Romano. He's, oh, the probation officer part was funny. Yeah, that's this LG. He's always, he's always good for um, an LG-esque comment. It's, how was it say it that way, right? All right, uh, Gary Kelly Jr. says, happy Friday, Ron. Now I have a thousand, no, 11,000 square foot yard. I was thinking on getting the Primo Max, how long will that last on my yard? It depends on the kind of grass you have. With Bermuda, one of these will do 16,000 square feet, right? We'll do 16,000 square feet at the 0.25 ounce rate. So on your lawn, you're gonna be using one of these almost like once a month, right? Because you have a, a larger lawn. So if you have a 4,000 square foot lawn, you could get you can get like four four months of applications out of this, but for a larger property, you're gonna be going through more of it. So um, yeah, so 16, one bottle, 16,000, 16, they're about 16,000 square feet, again, depending on the rates that you use. So in your lawn, a month and change, a month and a half. So once every, yeah, so you'd buy, you'd go through, a, you'd go through um, two bottles every three months. That's gonna give you a little bit of, a little bit of uh, headway, so. Yeah, two, two bottles every three months is what I would say, based on how I spray it, what you would use, given that you have, you didn't tell me. I'm assuming it's Bermuda. If it's Bermuda, that's correct. If it's, you have like a cool season lawn, then it's gonna be less than that because the rates for cool season grass are higher 
than they are for Bermuda or Zoysia. So depends on the kind of grass you have, Gary. If it's Bermuda, um, one every, or two every three months is what you're, you'd be looking at. Of the four ounce bottles anyway. And you said, or how many treatments? I just, yeah, I just answered. So yeah, 16,000 square feet out of a four ounce bottle, assuming you're doing Bermuda. So given the size of your lawn, two bottles every three months is uh, what, you, what you're gonna wanna do. All right, next up, Mike Harvey is in the house. He says, hey, Ron, um, how many scoops of certainty should I use in a four gallon backpack sprayer adding it to my prodiamine for Poannua? Um, I could tell you what I would do. It's not the only not the only way of doing this, but so I would say uh, one, two, three, four. Um, so four of the large scoops, Mike. And again, I'm, I'm assuming that you're spraying this over four thousand square feet because that's the real thing, right? It depends on what, how you're diluting it. I'm assuming you're covering four thousand square feet with this. So you would do four of the large scoops, and let's call it six of the small scoops in four gallons of water. That's going to be that's gonna be above the 1.25 ounce per acre rate, um, which should produce a pretty good result with um, when you're you're taking, you're trying to spray Poannua. So I've, t I've tested it, I've tried, like if, if you wanna go with the low end of the rate of certainty for Poa, it's just one large scoop. So you could technically do like four of the large scoops in four gallons of water or 4,000 square feet, and that will work. What I have found is that doing that is it um, it yellows the Poa, it beats it up, kind of dings it, depending on how old, how mature it is but it doesn't really fully put it out. Whereas if you bump that rate up just a little bit, not necessarily going all the way to the two ounces per acre rate, but just a little bit above the 1.25 ounce um, rate, you get a better, you get a much better control. So play with it. I would um, I would do at least four of the large scoops at a, that's the base for POA, and you can add a little bit more um, on top of that, depending on how close to, you know, the, the, the two ounce per acre you want to get. So. In my case, I, for me, I would do four large and then say six of the small. That's that's going to produce a. I think it's going to produce a pretty good result for you, um, controlling Poa annua. Again, assuming you're spraying that over four thousand square feet, don't take that blend now and go spray it over a thousand square feet, over two thousand square feet. That would be too much. I'm assuming four gallons, one gallon per thousand square feet is what you're going to be doing. So, got to give you all these qualifiers to make sure that you're not going to not going to do anything crazy. So, hope that helps, uh, Mike, um, and let me know how it works out for you. Uh, let's see, uh, what rates do you recommend for centipede grass for using prodiamine, Celsius, and certainty? Um, I have, you know, I have to check the label for prodiamine. I don't know off the top of my head what the rate is for prodiamine. Can I find that really quickly? I can probably find that really quickly. I'm not sure what they, what they call for, for centipede, because I don't have a centipede lawn, and I don't have that many people that ask me about centipede, but the label should tell us. Right, the label should tell us. Let's see here. All right, so there's prodiamine, and there is the label. And if we search for centipede, mm, 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 mm. okay, so yes, it's the same. So if I look here, um, Albert, it's um, the same rate that you would use for Bermuda grass, Bahia, Zoysia, it's the same rate. So between 0.36 uh, on the low end up to 0.83 uh, being the annual limit. If you want to be conservative, you could kind of you could go somewhere in between there. Like you know, you could do 0.4 to 0.5 ounces um, on your centipede lawn. Because again, I've never sprayed I've never sprayed um, uh, a centipede lawn with prodiamine to know what rates it it responds well to. Again, assuming you're the, according to the label, it'll tolerate you know that entire range. But if you just try to be conservative, you could go 0.4 to 0.5 ounces per thousand square feet, and then for Celsius and um, and certainty, I don't believe there's a there's a, a special rate for um, for centipede grass, but we can look here really quick. Why not? We can learn something new together, right? Why not? All right. So where is the Celsius label? Da, 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 da. Uh, where am I? Um, how to use? And there's the label. And if I search for centipede, I don't think there is one. I think I think it's. Yeah, I think it's the same. I don't. I don't think it really. Um, I, I don't think there's anything special that's called out for, for centipede. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Yeah. See, so if you look here, Albert, if you look on the label for instances of centipede, there's only three. There's one where it says it's labeled for centipede use. Um, one of the in the header, and then one here talks about um, the grasses that tolerate that tolerate um, 
Celsius just fine. So uh, the rates that the same rates that you use for Bermuda should work well for centipede. There's there's really there are two. I mean, there's more there's more than two rates, but there's there's two ways that you can you can really spray it. So like the lower end, the lower rate is like um, is 0.226 ounces or one of these to so the low end, one of these packets uh, with uh, with four gallons of water over 4,000 square feet. That's like the medium lower rate. And if you are going for the higher rate and really the, which rate you go with really should be determined by the, the weed you're trying to control. Because the label does specify if you're trying to control this, go with the higher rate. If you're going with trying to control these, go with the lower rate. Um, so look at the label to know which one. But if you're going with the higher rate, you would use one of these packets, 0 0.226, 0 0.226 ounces in two gallons of water, and you'd spray that over 2,000 square feet. So it really depends on which way you are, are looking to go. Um, like, you know, what, how, how heavy your, um, your, like what you're trying to control. And if you want to go towards the higher end or lower end based on, you know, the weed that you're, that you're after. But there's, from what I'm seeing here for both prodiamine and for Celsius, there's no special guidance for, um, that's specific to centipede grass. So if you want to be conservative, you can, you can back the rate of prodiamine down a little bit, and you can also spray Celsius at a lower rate. And then for certainty, um, the rate that you see in the video there on the on the store is already on the lower end. It's like I, I show like three. I'm, I'm spraying it like the 0.75 per rate, um, 0.75 ounces per acre rate in the video that you see that's on the the golf course lawn store and on YouTube. So that should be fine for centipede. So hope that helps, sir. Um, from what I can tell, well, we both looked at it together. I don't see any special guidance, so you should be good. But again, if you want to be conservative, just back the rate down a little bit and uh, and see what you get. All right, next up is Colin C. Pims. He says, uh, Ron, I'm starting to incorporate, I plan to start incorporating lawn care stuff onto my channel. Figured it would be cool to document the process of it all. Going to be fun. Nice, very cool, Colin. Yeah, you should do that. I mean, because the thing is, man, like the thing with lawn care, right? It's like, a, it's something that never ends. And that's the thing about that I particularly find fun. There's always something new to try, always something new to learn. And even when the lawn looks great, it's gonna look really awesome for this period of time. And then it's gonna either, it's gonna fall off from that, right? So it's never perfect forever. Um, so, but the way to really appreciate how far you've come is to document it. Like definitely, you know, definitely like shoot video pictures of, of how the lawn looks before, while you're doing the process and then afterwards. Cause really, it, because you're like a lawn nerd and you look at the lawn all the time, like it's, you don't really appreciate um, like how much it's changing. It's almost like someone that works out, you know what I mean? Say you're overweight and you begin working out a lot and say you lose, you know, 10 pounds, or whatever. You stare at yourself all the time in the mirror. And you're like, oh, nothing's really changing. But then, you know, someone that hasn't seen you for like a couple of months will be like, oh man, you know, Colin, you've lost a bunch of weight. And you're like, really? I think I look the same. So you, it's hard for you to appreciate something when you're just staring at it all the time. All, all you tend to see is the flaws. So I think it's a great idea. I think you should um, you definitely shoot videos, take pictures of it, and yeah, put it on YouTube. Like share it, share it with everybody else. That's how, that's literally how this my channel started out. I did it as a as a way to document um, what I was doing on the lawn, and then people started finding it useful. And here we go, right? So um, I would say that. Um, the only thing I would I might advise for you is if you um, like if you I don't know what kind of content's on your channel, but if you intend to continue making a lot of the content that you currently make that is not lawn care related, it's it's a good idea to start a new channel. So you can be like Collins Lawn Care, CPM's Lawn Care, whatever you wanna call it. Um, but if you're not gonna do that anymore, like so you're not gonna, you have no plans to make any more of the, the old content, it's all gonna be lawn care, then you can, you, know, you can keep the same one. It's really your call which way you wanna go, but I wouldn't like have a channel about, I don't know, like say bowling and then one on lawn care because the audiences for those two, there's not a big like, there's not a huge intersection between those. You know what I mean? So you want to make sure that you're the con that there's some kind of focus to the channel. It's the only a piece of advice I would give you. All right. Um, you said especially the renovation that I've got planned for the front. Yeah, man, shoot video of it. We want to see it. We all we all want to we want to share on the journey with you, man. So videos, pictures, definitely do that. Uh, let's see here. Um, Never Stop uh, Cruising says, Ron, I put down Spectacle Flow in September at the posted rate, and the results have been awesome. Do tell. It does actually. It works. Huh? Who would have thunk it? Is this when should the second app be applied? I wouldn't do another app of spectacle this time of year. Um, never stop cruising. Like if you were gonna do a split app, I would have done one in September and I would have done another one in December. Uh, this this time of year, I'd start looking into doing your spring pre-emergence. So prodiamine or dithiapyr, that is what I would do. But yeah, I'm glad to hear that you got great results with spectacle. It's, um again, it's not cheap, so it better work and it does, right? I mean, I, I, until someone comes up with something better, um, that is, 
I mean, I think that's really that's really the one to use if you care about Poanua in warm season turf. Like, I mean, there's other there's other good um, pre-emergence out there, but Spectacle is uh, is pretty pretty awesome, pretty awesome. And then Jason Harrison says he says um, I have a Sunjo. It comes with a rake uh, and Scarifier slash Verticutter. The photo is the rake set about five millimeters above the surface. So there you go. See, so he did he set it up properly. So he wasn't like setting up the, the the rake where it was like digging channels or cutting channels into the soil. It was set up to where literally it was like just combing the debris out of the canopy, out of the out of the the lawn, which is exactly what you want. You don't. It's not. You're not supposed to be. I mean, it's not designed to like cut trenches into the soil. It's designed to, to clean, to lightly clean the debris out. When you hear people say like, oh, you know, when you turf rake Bermuda grass, you're gonna destroy it, you're gonna mess it up, you're gonna rip it up and all this kind of stuff. It's, if you set it up improperly, yeah, I absolutely would agree with that. Like if you get it set up to where you're you're digging channels into the into the dirt, then yeah, that's gonna, it's too aggressive and you're gonna cause, you're gonna cause more harm than good. But if you set it up properly where it's above the surface, which is how you're really supposed to do it, then you know you don't really have an issue. Like whenever I verticut my lawn, and you guys can actually see it, there's a live stream from last year, I think it's in May, where I turf rake, verticut, and then finally mow the lawn all live, and you guys can see it. And the lawn looks better and better and better as I do each one of those things because the equipment is set up to where it's not like you know I'm not like taking a bunch of dirt and garbage out of the out of the you know I'm not taking soil out with me whenever I'm doing those those practices. So it's all in how you set the equipment up. Um, but that's going to determine the quality of the result that you get. So, good job, Jason. Glad to. Thanks for sharing that, and I'm glad that your your lawn looks awesome. Looks great. Uh, Victor says, "Thank you for the info on reels. I've noticed the difference in your content. Um, I will be trying your plan this season, and maybe I can get an outlet next season. It does seem to be worth it. It is. So here's the thing. So yes, it is. If you want the convenience of having one piece of equipment that can do all of that stuff, yes." Now, is getting like, you know, because the price of them has gone up quite a bit. I mean, they're they're I'm priced what the um what the oh the sterling costs these days. But um, you know, you, if you get a, a good real mower, like a revolution or whatever, or a greens master, and you go and do it like what Jason did, where you have like the Sun Joe, which can verticut and turf rake, you know, you're 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 a lot of the way there, man. I mean, the the big thing you're also getting then is the ability to um, to catch all the debris. So I, I'm not sure how well the Sun Joe does as far as catching the clip, the, the, not the clipping, but all the trash that comes out of the lawn. Like the Allied equipment is very good about that. So like literally when you're, vert, when you're verticutting and you're turf raking, like 90% like of the garbage goes into the grass catcher, which sounds like a small thing, but it's really a huge thing. Cause then you have to go back and um, you know clean, clean a bunch of garbage out of the lawn. So that's the, I mean, if I had to say like a benefit um, like that would be it. Like it's going to do better. Like one, a more expensive piece of equipment is going to do a better job catching all the debris. It's going to be heavier. So it's going to do a better job um, with both the verticutting and the turf raking. But I don't know if that's worth several thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Like you, I, if you, if you went with a powered, like a good quality reel mower and then a, um, you know, something like a Sun Joe, depending on the size of your lawn, you know, you that that might be enough, man. That might be enough to do it. I mean, if you if where an outlet also makes more sense. If you have a, a large lawn, that's where it begins to really make a lot more sense. But if you have a smaller lawn, then you could probably get by with just a real mower and and a sun joe. You know what I mean? So it just really depends on you how much how much money you have to to burn, um, and you know how much it how much it means to you. So hope that helps. You can look at again look at Jason's lawn. Look at my lawn. I mean, there's there's a difference, but the difference is largely due to the differences in weight of the equipment. Again, you're talking about something that's like I don't know what a Sun Joe weighs, say 40, 50 pounds, I'd imagine, and then like 300 plus pounds, you know? So there's a difference, but is that like several thousand dollars better? I don't know. You have to you have to tell me, right? And then uh, Jason says, I have ordered the version with a high quality 100 foot cord. Cool. Yep. So there you go. So you have the one that plugs in. All right. Uh, next says, David Hill says, where is the best place to get bent grass seed for greens? Mm, I do not know that, David. I um, I wish Devin were still in here. He'd be able to tell you. I, I've i never bought bent grass to be able to um, to be able to, to say for sure. Um, you know who you could ask? Um, reach out to a company called um, Hancock Seed. I believe they're in Lakeland, Florida. Like go to their website or go on Google, just type like Hancock seed and they'll come up and then ask them because that's all they do is, is, is grass seed and they'll be able to, if they don't carry it, they'll be able to point you in the right direction of where you can get some, um, you can get some good bent grass. Um, 
but yeah, you know, what's the stuff they use in the map? Is it is it the, is the pen is it pen A1? I think it's the stuff they use on the I don't know. You guys will, will check me here. I think pen A1 is the stuff they use on the masters um uh greens, I think. Um, but I don't know. Can you even I'm sure you can even buy it? Uh yeah, pen A1 bent grass. Where you get it, you have to you have to look online and see where you can find it, assuming you can get even get it. Um, but that's the stuff that Augusta National uses so you can get your hands on it that would be I mean with knowing nothing about bent grass if I were going to try and create a green and I were going to make it a bent grass green that is what I would go with so um, this is what it's called uh, David um, so you can you can go from uh, you can go from there you can see who carries it and um, what it's going to cost you I mean Augusta National is using it so it's probably not going to be cheap uh, but if you like how the greens of the Masters looks, I mean, in addition to everything else they do, right? The C's just one, is just one, one part of it. Um, then that's that's what you could look into. Again, for someone that, does, that has never done a bent grass green, um, I do know that's the stuff they use on uh, on the, the Masters golf course. So see if you can find that or find out who carries it and, and give it a go. That would be my suggestions. A golf junkie says, why are biosimilants important? Excellent question. So the idea behind biosimilants, if you think about the way how fertilizer... Um, fertilizer works, right? If you apply a granular fertilizer um, to the soil, like microbes and and beneficial fungi break that down, like break the, the fertilizer down and convert it into a um, convert the nitrate into a form that is available for uptake by the grass. So it's so we th we think about fertilizer, we think about water, but we don't think about the healthy bugs and bacteria that are in the soil, which are really the engine of the soil. That's what really makes the nutrients, a lot of the inputs that we that we put into the soil work. So biostimulants help, by the name implies, they help stimulate that, right? So by using um, like biochar products, compost products um, that, that add additional organic material, products like Essential G. Um, so I can actually show you what I'm talking about here. I'm golf junkie. Um, so using by using a good biostimulant program, what you'll find is you're able, so from a granular biostimulant, what I use is Essential G, so I use on my lawn monthly. It is biochar, reclaimed coffee grounds, compost, humate, and silica. Um, so that's that the blend that's in that. And then the carbon kit, the Golf Salon carbon kit is like three products. Um, release Zero, which is a biostimulant, Renutra Kelp, which is a biostimulant and also contains a kelp product. And then biospectrum, which is a soil microbial food. So it's like literally you're you're introducing more bug, more healthy bugs and fungi, fungi into the soil to help you know improve the, the the efficiency of that machine that really makes makes it all work. So what you find the benefit that you that you get from um, using biosimilants as part of your lawn care program is you're able to get by with less inputs, right? So like if you ask if you go on Google right now and you say like how much nitrogen on Bermuda, right? And they'll, what you'll come up with, there'll be different, you know, different answers, but the, the, the typical census is that for, um, you know, a thousand, well, sorry, one pound of nitrogen um, per month when the grass is actively growing. So, you know, you know five-ish, five to six pounds of nitrogen per year, depending on, on your lawn. What I have been able to do because of the biostimulant program that I that I use um, on my lawn and what I still teach in the Golf Course Lawn Academy is I'm I run about se about thirty percent less nitrogen as far as what I put into my my lawn. So I, I apply um, it all adds up to about seven tenths of a pound. So you're able to put less inputs in and you still have a lawn that looks great. Like you still have turf grass that looks that looks incredible with less inputs. So. If you think about it, like great grass is a byproduct of great soil and biostimulants are inputs that literally are focused on improving soil quality. So if you want awesome, awesome turf grass, like having, making sure there's, there's adequate organic material and, and that, you know, you're doing all these things to help, um, to help the engine of the soil work as efficiently as possible is, you know, is, is, um, makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, again, you can look at pictures of my lawn. You can look at pictures of other people that are that. Um, I mean, go go on on the Golf Horse Lawn Store and look at the reviews from folks that have that that use the stuff. And you, the pictures say for themselves. You know, I mean, how these people. I mean, I don't I don't know like ninety percent of them. I've never met ninety percent of them, right? But they've used it and they they report that hey, I've started using this stuff and my grass has never looked better. So there's there's definitely something to it. Um, it's it's another component in like in everything that it takes to, in my opinion, to grow uh, like an amazing stand of turf grass. So hope that helps Golf Junkie. It's a great question. Um, and um, if you have anything else, feel free to reach out. And you know, on that topic, 
I've got, you know, selfish plug, but I've got an entire, I've got a couple pieces of content, but I've got um, entire articles written on biostimulants on that, um, on that topic. So what I'm going to do is I'll link them both here in the chat for you in case you want to know even more like what else, what else can I, can I learn about this? Um, so there's at least two of them, if I can find it. There we go. So if you also care about more sustainable, a more sustainable approach to lawn care, biosimilants are awesome for that purpose. And then um, as far as a breakdown of, of the different biosimilants and what they all do, um, I have a blog post here on that topic. If I can find it, it is right here. Cool. Yep, I got both of them. So uh, let me link both these here for you in the chat, and then you will be uh, you'll be set. So here is um, BioStim blog one, uh, that one, and then the more recent one is this guy, which is how biosimilants can help you know support a sustainable approach to to lawn care. In case you care about that, which we all we all should, right? Um, blog two, and yeah, so take a look at both of those. Plenty of great content in there, and um, hopefully my explanation also makes sense. But that's also like some support, some supporting documentation that will um, that will hopefully answer your question. All right, uh, let's uh, next up is um, M two um, or Microflyer. Huh? Microflyer says Microdefu Flyer says, can you talk a little about soluble fertilizer, how to mix, mm. how to um, figure out the amount of nitrogen? Uh, I, you have to look at the label. Um, um, micro two flyer. I don't, I don't use, um, I don't really use, um, soluble fertilizers. If you're talking about like fertilizers that are dry and you suspend them in water and then you spray them. Um, I don't use any of those. So I, I would say just consult, consult the label. Like I use granulars and then I also use, um, liquid ferts like, um, 901C, turf plex, like those kind of guys. So, um, so yeah, I, I, as far as how to mix, the label is going to tell you that. Like they, they're going to have, they're going to have really clear guidance. They're going to say, I imagine along the lines of, if you're trying to, for you're trying to spray a thousand square feet, and this is the goals as far as how much nitrogen you're trying to put into the the lawn. You know, weigh out this much of it, get it suspended in water, add it to your tank, and then go spray the lawn. That's, I imagine that's what it's going to say. But as far as like what the rates are going to be like, I, I have no idea. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be a whole lot of help um, for you on that one. You know, and on the topic of liquid fertilizers, um, we just got, if you guys know for a while, we, we, the liquid ferts that we carry from Ecologel were out of stock and they just came back in stock. So like Turfplex, Nutrizolve, Bloomplex, Greens Plus, they're all, they just got replenished. So they're all back in stock now. So get them while you can, get them while it's hot because they, last season, there was always a problem with them selling out. So um, if you're looking to get those, they're now available. Feel free to knock yourself out. Um, they are, they're back in stock. All right, uh, let's see what we have here. Next up is um, uh, CPMC. That's interesting on the prodiamine rates. I use Barricade 4L that has the same active ingredient and the rates for worm crafts are 0.5 to, to 1.1 ounces. Yeah, you, the reason why, um, Colin, if you look at the amount of active ingredient in the 4L, I want to say it's like 40% prodiamine. Let me make sure. Make sure I'm not lying to you here. I don't want to lie to you, Colin. Let me see here. Um, let me see. Briarcade 4, yeah, 4L. I want to say it's like 40%. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. So it's 40.8%. 40% of the active ingredient of prodiamine, whereas the stuff that I'm talking about, like the stuff that we carry in the Gulf Coast Salon store is 65%. So that's the difference. That's the reason for the differences in rates, right? So the stuff that I'm using, the rates, like there's there's more of the active ingredient, so you would use less of it to get the same the same control makes sense so that's why your rates are um are noticeably higher with the 4l versus like the 65 which is in um the water dispersible granule so hope that helps all right uh brian turner uh says he says hey ron i use a sun joe to turf rake i set mine a 10 millimeter or the highest setting it cleaned out a lot of debris ready for pre-emergent tomorrow i also got my humic max fert this week thanks you are very Welcome. Sounds like you are on your way, sir. And then Colin has given on your recommendation, David, for grass seed. He says, out here in Cali, we have Stover Seed Company. They got a lot of seed varieties. Actually got my seashore paspalum seed from them. Great company. Yeah, so look into them. Look into, you know, look, I'd say this. If you're looking for bent grass, um, look into to pen A1 and then see, like, who carries it. You know, how hard it is to get the stuff. And then, you know, you, that'll probably take you down a rabbit hole of all the various types of grass seed, of bent grass, uh, grass seed, and you can decide which way you, um, like, which one is for you. You know what I mean? 
but it's not something I have any direct experience with, so I can't say this one is better than this one or this is the results I've gotten because I've never, I've never actually um, planted bent grass. Uh, let's see. Um, it says, um, how do you get the Princep? Do you need a license? Um, depends on what state you're in, but most places, most times you can just go to like a local supplier and they will sell it to you. So let, you can buy it. Um, so it depends on the state you're in, whether or not you require one. I don't know if there's one really required for Princep. I mean, depending, it depends on the state. This is a state by state thing. Um, but there's online retailers for it. Just look up Princep online and it'll be, I mean, Google will, there'll be tons of people that will be willing to sell you. Uh, sell you some prints up. All right. Uh, next up is Brian. He says, after mixing up biostems per label, I have a 3,500 square foot lawn. Can you store the little mix that's left over for the next app or will it degrade? I would spray it, especially biospectrum. So I've, I've had this question before, Brian. Um, Miramichi Green, um, I've, I've asked him, hey, can you store this for a couple of weeks before you do for when you're going to do your next app? And they say, no, like you should mix what you're, you should mix what you intend to use. And when it comes to biospectrum, you're not going to hurt anything by spraying the leftover that you have on the lawn. You know what I mean? Like I would not just let it sit there in the tank. I would spray it and uh, and use it up. So to answer your question, no, I would not. Um, I would not hang on to it. I would not hang on to it. Uh, next up, our last question of the evening, possibly, is uh, Mister. Uh, it's Audacity. He says, "Hey Ron, got my Prodiamine out this week and will be out of town for the first three weeks of March. What should my strategy be to scalp, start insecticide, etc. in the middle of Georgia?" So scalping depends on. If you want to do that or not, March is a good time to do to, to scalp your lawn if that's what you want to do. Insecticide, I am a fan of doing that in um, April. So um, late March, early April time frame is when I like to get my Acela print out. Um, and then that's it. So yes, you're good. So if you got your Prodiamine out, you're going to be out of town the first three weeks of March. You know, if, if you can scalp, if you want to scalp before you go, that's fine. If you want to scalp when you get back, that's going to be fine too. And then insecticide really late March, early April. So what you really could do, um, Audacity, is you could literally go out of town beginning of March, and then when you come back, do all of it. You could scalp and do your insecticide, and then be be good to go. You know what I mean? So that's that would be uh, that would be just fine too. Next up is Kevin Banks. He says hello from Savannah, Georgia. What's going on, Kevin Banks from Savannah, Georgia? Uh, Everyday life says. He says, what do you do if you have Bermuda sod and there's an area with a hit of shade. You either get rid of the shade or you grow a different type of grass. Because Bermuda and shade, like I've said it before in the past, Bermuda and shade are like ice cream and mayonnaise. They just don't go together. Like you can try all you want. Like some things just do not go together and Bermuda and shade is one of those things. So, and it, it does not take a lot to get, um, to, for it to really negatively affect how well the Bermuda grows. What you'll find is if you have a little bit of shade is it'll thin out a bit. If you have a lot of shade, that you can have an area that's just bare dirt. So I would look into ways of of reducing uh, the shade, or simply turn that area into a mulch bed or or something else. But Bermuda is not going to grow in a, in a shaded lawn. It's just not going to happen. So um, hopefully that saves you a bunch of a bunch of time and money because I, there are some companies that will like put out grass seed and say, hey, look, we have like shade tolerant Bermuda or shade tolerant southern grass, and what they really mean is there may be some Bermuda in there, but really it's like fescue. So they put like fescue in there, which will grow in the shade, but Bermuda will not, um, it just it just doesn't do well in, in shade. It, just, it will not. Like I, I, I tell the story practically every week, but like in my front lawn, I have a shrub that's near the sidewalk. And it's probably, it's probably four feet tall, so it's not a really big plant. Um, and outside of that shrub, there is plenty of sunlight. There's not a lot of other areas shading it, but, but that, that shrub, that four foot shrub is enough that the grass that's within three feet of it, like a three feet, three foot band all the way around that shrub doesn't, I mean, it's not, it's not bare, but it, it is, it is noticeably thinner than the rest of the lawn. And that's just due to sunlight. It just gets that, that shit, that small little plant ca just casts just enough shade that the rest of the lawn doesn't do as, um, doesn't do as well. You know what I mean? So, um, I, I say all this to try and tell you that it's a it's not worth the effort to try and get Bermuda to grow in shade because it's just not going to. It's just, it's just not going to do well. You're never going to be happy with it. All right, uh, Sam J says, oh, we have a thing here. He says, um, huge amount of uh, rain headed our way in Georgia. I have not used my pre-emergent yet. Rain is just non-ending. Hopefully I can get it down tomorrow. Yeah, if you can get your, your pre am out tomorrow, that would be ideal because then um, you, know, you get it watered in for free, which is always nice, free... Uh, rainfall, free, free irrigation is, uh, is always a nice thing. And he says, what can you do, uh, 
timid to timid Bermuda that looks similar. I don't understand the question, the everyday life. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean. What can you do to, to timid? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, if you're talking about, I, I'm, I don't understand the question. I'm not sure what you're, what you're asking. But the long and short of it is Bermuda will not grow in shade. Even if someone tells you, oh, there's a more shade tolerant Bermuda, which I mean, you, they'll technically say like Tiff Tough is slightly more shade tolerant than other types, but it still needs all the sunlight. You know what I mean? So it's, I would not, like Bermuda needs sunlight, full stop. Like I sound like a broken record, but do not try and grow Bermuda in an area with a lot of shade. You're gonna be wasting your time. It's just never gonna look good. All right. And you said um, to mix the Bermuda. Oh, I would not, I wouldn't do that. So, so yeah, because you're not gonna really gain anything. In other words, like I, I told another viewer that asked a question similar to this earlier. If you have an area of your lawn where the existing Bermuda is not growing well, and this, this assumes that you don't have any debris in, in like under the soil, there's not some kind of a nutrient problem. Like if you go and you introduce another type of Bermuda grass, you're gonna end up with the exact same thing. I mean, it might germinate, but then it's gonna behave exactly the same way as with the existing, as how the existing grass is gonna behave. And you're gonna have another cultivar that's not gonna match your existing lawn. So I would not do that. So like either get what you have now to grow well, or like just deal with it not being, be, deal with the grass being thin in that area, or you could go to like a different grass type, like a fescue or something, or you could say that area, I'm not gonna grow any grass there, I'm not gonna make it into a mulch bed or something that's decorative that looks nice, that is not grass. But Bermuda and grass, Bermuda and shade are like ice cream and mayonnaise, they just do not work together. It's not, it's just not gonna happen. You're wasting your time trying to, trying to make that, trying to make that work. Um, and he says, so it's a grass similar to Bermuda that does not look too different. Mm, none that I can really think of. I mean, cool season grasses don't look like Bermuda. Um, and, and here's why you wouldn't want to do that. Let's say you could, right? Just we'll, we'll talk about this for a little bit. We're towards the end of the show. Um, even if you could find, a, let's say you could find like a cool season grass that looks kind of like Bermuda, right? Um, the problem you're going to start running into then is that the herbicides that you can use on cool season grass versus warm season grass are very different. Um, the selective ones anyway, and um, the growth rates are going to be different. So, um, and if you're using growth regulator, like the rates for that are different. If you're using, I mean, it's just, there's a, like mixing cool season and warm season grass, while some people like to do it, and the only way you really would do that, and that I think makes sense, is if you're doing it in the fall when Bermuda's checking out and you're only going to have, say, a cool season lawn, which pretty much means you're only having one grass type at a time. Um, but trying to grow them both together uh, especially if they're in the same area, like they're touching, it's in the same area. It's not like you had, it'd be, it'd be different if you had like say the back lawn is a cool season grass and the front lawn is warm season. So where they're really just two separate lawns for all intents and purposes. If that's the case then fine. But if you're trying to grow like a small section as a cool season lawn and, and right up uh, next to it is gonna be Bermuda, I just, I really wouldn't do that. Take for example, your pre-emergent. Like the pre-emergent rates for prodiamine for Bermuda are several times, they're quite a bit higher than what they are for cool season grass. So you're just creating a lot of headache for yourself that just not, in my opinion, just not really not really worth it. Um, okay, so we got a couple of questions here. Sam says, I'm concerned that the amount of rainfall will wash out the pre-emergent. Kind of unlikely, Sam, unless your lawn is very, is like a, a, it's a steep grade and you're getting, you know, ten, a ton of rainfall. Uh, that's when you might be concerned about it, but it's um, like most people worrying about, oh, I just applied my pre-emergent and I'm getting like heavy rain. It's like you're. It's overblown as far as that. Like washing away, um, washing away the pre-emergent. It's not not really a thing. Uh, I really, I really wouldn't sweat it too much unless, again, unless you live on a, on a really steep grade. And the way you're going to be able to tell is after when all the rain um, happens, and say you're applying a granular. If you go to the bottom of the lawn, like the lowest part, if you see a bunch of yellow there, then then you know that oh, the prodiamine that I applied, a lot of it got washed down. But if you don't see that, you're good to go. And what I think you're going to see is you're not going to see that. It's going to be it's going to be just fine. All right, uh, Dan Lynch, he says, what is the max mix rate for Celsius uncertainty for spot spraying POA? I'm in Texas, Bermuda. Okay, so if you're spraying POANUA, if all you care about is POANUA, I would not use Celsius. Just, there's no reason to, to waste the Celsius. Just, just use the certainty. Like certainty is what's designed to do a good job controlling POANUA. Celsius isn't gonna do a whole lot for you on that. So for certainty, the rate that I like to use with POANUA is above the little, the, the, the lower end of the rate range. So it's between 1.25 ounces per acre up to two ounces per acre. So what that equates to, Dan, is certainty is gonna come with a measuring spoon. And I, I will use one of the large scoops and then one or two of the small scoops 
and you can put that in a gallon of water or two gallons of water, whatever you want, and you spray that over a thousand square feet. So a thousand, so one large scoop and two small scoops over a thousand square feet. If you're spot spraying, that's gonna be fine too. That's gonna that's gonna produce a good result for controlling poannua. And then make sure you use a surfactant with it and leave Celsius out of the mix. No need to use Celsius. All right, okay. And um, next up we got, uh, bah, 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 um, B PC Bree says half um, 0.5 um, uh, per gallon. Um, and then SS, let's see here. Um, SS says, um, hey, Ron, I'm about to spread tenacity on St. Augustine tomorrow. Um, any tips? Why are you using tenacity on on St. Aug on St. Augustine? Um, yeah, I don't, I think that tenacity is only really labeled for you. I think, I, Memory serving, I could be wrong on this, but I believe tenacity is only labeled for use on, on like if you have like a sod farm or something, but on, on residential lines, I don't think you're supposed to be using um, tenacity on St. Augustine. Again, I might be wrong on that, but I, I, I believe that is, I believe that is correct. All right, and our last question of the evening, we're gonna, we're gonna um, shut down after this one is Abraham uh, Soto. He says, uh, what is this? Um, I have tons, get me wrong, I have tons of acorns on my lawn. How would you clean up to be able to real mow also located in South Gainesville? Um, how, also how close are you so that I can follow your application timing? Yeah, I'm, I'm like a few, I'm like 10, 15 miles from Gainesville. So we're essentially the same. Um, as cleaning up acorns, if you have some kind of a turf rake like a Sun Joe or um, or just have like a good grass rake, maybe you know something like that would work too. Uh, just some kind of a rake to get them to get them out of the lawn. Um, that's how I would go about doing it. So if you have a, a, a light grass rake, that can work. If you have a um, if you have a if you want a, like a, a powered approach, then you can go with um, uh, then like a like a sun joe or, or something along those lines. But you are doing the right thing from the standpoint of getting that stuff out of the lawn before you real mow it because you don't want to like the, the the way to make an edge on your real mower lasts longer. So you're gonna spend all this money and time getting it sharpened is to mow only grass with it. Meaning don't run over pine cones, don't run over acorns, don't run over twigs, like just, just only cut grass with it. That's gonna make it last uh, a lot longer. So hope that helps. Um, and yeah, as far as fertilizer timing, my, my first fertilizer app, again, depending on weather, um, it's gonna be the 12 0 and that's likely gonna be in March timeframe. And then I'll transition to Humic Max uh, after that. So, um, so there you go. All right, guys, gals, I think we, I think that's pretty much it. Um, PC Breeze have already answered your question before, so I think we're good. Really appreciate you guys coming to hang out with me on the live stream tonight. Lots of great questions, lots of, uh, lots of fun, lots of fun stuff. Hopefully I'm pressing you guys the importance of getting your pre-emergent down. If you, you know, if there's tons of content that they're on the Golf Horse Lawn Store on the blog about pre-emergent. Hope you see the value of it and uh, would really encourage you guys to add that to your lawn care program because it's a great way to keep your lawn weed free in 2024. Really appreciate you guys watching the content. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. It really does mean a lot because we're gonna be putting out um, some great content this year in addition to the live stream. So subscribe so you don't miss that. If you need your pre-emergent, post-emergent herbicides, biostimulants, fertilizer, we have them all in stock on the Golf Course Lawn Store. So definitely feel free to stop by there and pick up all your lawn care accoutrement. And until next time, I will see you guys. Take care. Be good.